related to planning. And we decided it would be good to continue meeting two or three times a year. My understanding is that this had occurred in the past and just stopped happening. Uh, so, uh, so that was a, a good and productive meeting. Both the city and the town are on the TCOG, the Tompkins County Council of Governments Energy Committee. And this year we're gonna focus on proactively addressing potential in infrastructure limitations based on increased electrification. Luis Aguera Torres was instrumental in identifying this as a focus and several municipalities are excited to, it's not an easy subject to work on, but see how we can collectively apply pressures when needed, just what we might do. Uh, so once in a while, I'm assuming you'll hear reports about the TCOG Energy Committee. I know both the city and the town are excited about trails. Uh, so the town has a number of trails, parks, preserves, and we'll continue to look at pedestrian and biking quarters. We're working to connect and extend trails, usually in partnership with sister municipalities. And we're very excited about the future connections for the Gateway Trail, the Black Diamond Trail, and the South Hill Recreation Way. By the way, I cannot stay on, uh, on this meeting, so my apologies, but I'm delighted about a resolution that will be coming up later uh, the town board fully supports the action that you will be taking. Community choice aggregation. I know that, um, I believe that you've all been hearing about that as we uh, focus on it. The city and the town are working with consultant Paul Fenn to see how we can uh, jointly move forward with the idea that other municipalities would join the CCA either later this year or sometime uh, next year. It's, a, it's a, an exciting topic that has some complexities uh, associated with it. So, uh, but we're, we're very excited uh, to be working with the city on community choice aggregation. Short-term rentals, your turn. Uh, so I think everyone knows that we passed a law the very end of December, uh, committee had been working on it for four years. Uh, applications are now available on our website. Uh, you, we've already shared our law with a couple of uh, council members, but if anyone can't find it and wants to see it, let us know. We wish you well. Ask us questions uh, as you move forward on that. You know, and it's great when sometimes the city might take the lead on an issue and sometimes the town and then we share information. So we're continuing to work on our telecommunications law, which of course means focusing on 5G to some extent as well. So we're hoping that a draft of the new law will go to the town board sometime this summer. Green New Deal, we have our own version of a Green New Deal. There's similarities uh, between the town and the city. We now own our street lights. They'll be converted sometime this summer to LED. Uh, we're hoping to work with the city on your major electrification initiative. And uh, there will probably be a uh, MOU again between the town and the city uh, as we see how we work together on that. Usually I don't really worry if something's in the city or the town when I'm talking to the general public, but this one, I'm always gonna say it's in the town of Ithaca. So the Dalai Lama Library and Learning Center uh, the groundbreaking event happens later this month. I tell my friends across the US, it's amazing that the Dalai Lama's permanent library will be in, and I do say the town of Ithaca. So, but obviously we all enjoy the fact that it's going to be in our community. Inlet Valley, so that's the area between uh, Robert Treeman Park and Buttermilk Park, uh, we are, in the process of developing some new zoning overlays. We certainly want economic development activity to happen there, but we want to be pretty careful about the kind of activity that uh, we promote uh, between the two parks. Uh, so uh, stay tuned on that. We're well along in developing some overlays. I think everyone has heard about our South Hill New Neighborhood Code slash traditional new development. Uh, and that we're working toward a regulating plan for South Hill that will include mixed development. Uh, we had a charrette last fall and I'm hoping the regulating plan will come forward in the next uh, few months. 
OpenGov, I believe that the city is looking at OpenGov. This is a platform for permits and applications. We're hoping to go live with it next Wednesday. It's a pretty robust platform. We're pretty excited about it. Several departments, not just codes, will be using it. Um, and it really, I think, will make uh, a huge benefit to our residents as they engage with the town. So if you have any questions, if indeed you are looking at OpenGov, People have probably already been in touch with Marty Mosley, but we're happy to continue sharing information about OpenGov. We'll have a new website, uh, hopefully in about a month. Uh, our website right now is, I'll just say terrible. Um, so we're, we, it's pretty nice. Uh, I'm excited about uh, unveiling our new website. We also have a new mission and vision statement. Uh, so those will be, they're on our, our website now, but uh, they'll be more prominent on the new website. So it was an interesting experience to go through a mission statement and a vision statement for the town of Ithaca. And then of course, always, always, there's water and sewer infrastructure and intermunicipal agreements and discussions that are ongoing. I'll, I'll stop there, uh, see if there's any questions. Any questions for Rod? Okay, seeing. Well, thank you very much for having me. And again, I'm sorry I can't stay on, but yay for the resolution that you have later on in the agenda. Thank you very much, Rod. And thank you for okay. your assistance on that resolution that council will be considering later on our agenda. Much appreciated. Okay, take care, have a good meeting. Take care, thank you. We'll now turn to uh, a presentation from Jean Grace, our city forester, who will be describing um, some updates on the city cemetery and the Arboretum designation. And Jean, I see you there. So um, please welcome and uh, we're glad to hear from you. Hi. Um, Ellen is here too. She's going to be the one sharing screen. And I don't know, Julie, can you is see if Chris is Christine waiting in the waiting room to be let in? Christine O'Malley. Yeah, I just let her in, Jean. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for the reminder. There's Ellen. Okay, so Ellen's going to share her screen. Ellen will be the primary speaker um, for this presentation. She is a founding member of the Friends of the City Cemetery, which has been an incredibly beneficial group for the city to work with. Um, so she will be leading us through the presentation, and then I will throw in comments as needed. And then, of course, any questions you all have, I will be happy to answer. Take it away, Ellen. All right, I'm gonna stop my video because it seems to be a bit glitchy, but can everybody hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Great, um, and everybody can see the screen? Yes. All right, great. Uh, first of all, I wanna welcome all the new uh, members who are, who are just uh, joining. I think this is your fourth meeting so far, so welcome. And uh, of course, if any of you are interested in doing a tour with one of us of the cemetery, if you're not familiar with it, we're happy to accommodate that, whatever your schedule may be. Uh, my name is Ellen Leventree, as Jean said, and I am one of the co-founders of the Friends of the Ithaca City Cemetery. Uh, I also was on the Parks Commission and on the uh, more recent Pruner Commission. So I have a lot of um, connections with the city and working um, with Jean Grace and the for Parks and Forestry folks. All right, so let's see. Okay, there we go. I have a little bit of a lag. So uh, cemeteries obviously are amongst some of the most valuable of historic and cultural resources we have. 
But one thing that we need to take into consideration is that they are also valuable green spaces, uh, plant preserves and wildlife habitats. There's a huge body of research showing that there are at least a hundred different species that are being protected in uh, a, a general survey of cemeteries throughout the U US. Um, and especially with the increased population density of downtown Ithaca, this is the green space for many people. It is within walking distance. It is not across a major highway um, as getting to Stewart Park uh, often entails. And it is uh, centrally located between the Cornell campus and downtown and is often a through through affair for folks going from Cornell downtown. So the Friends of Ithaca City Cemetery is a completely voluntary organization and uh, we are under historic Ithaca and since 2017. Uh, we've cleaned and repaired over a thousand stones that also indicates uprighting them. Uh, organized 15 cleanup days, have worked with over 280 volunteers, have held numerous fundraisers, replaced 10 Re Revolutionary War um, gravestones that uh, we work with the Veterans Affairs Department to get free stones uh, that replace the old ones. We've worked toward uh, fundraising and installing three interpretive signs. Uh, Mason R.E. Kelly recently repaired three of the vaults. Vaults are the um, structures that are in, into the hillside there. Uh, and we did two last summer, or one last summer and two the summer before. We've updated and improved the work shed, um, installed historically accurate bollards, which just started today. Um, so that's very exciting and developed a new tree tour, planted a number of new trees and have since been designated a level one arboretum by ArbNet. So these are just some pictures of cleaning and repairing that's been going on. Um, you can see there's a lot of digging involved. So if any of you need to go out and do some exercise, we are always glad to have you be a part of it. Here we are using a tripod that an Eagle Scout troop uh, made for us, which helps us lift the heavier stones back into place. And these are some of the replacement markers I was just mentioning of the Revolutionary War soldiers. This is the, uh, in the below pictures, the Sons of the Revolutionary War from Binghamton. We did a, a ceremony uh, when all of the stones were in. Here we are, this is on Giving Tuesday, we raised funds for the signage that Duran Van Doren um, designed and made for us. And that was also Giving Tuesday and Tompkins Charitable Trust. And that's Seth Murtaugh. <laughs> so the tree tour, not only are we doing a number of tours, but um, Jean, Grace, and Kevin Vorstadt have done a whole tree inventory and have labeled the trees. And um, like I said, we have been accredited as an arboretum, which allows us to uh, go for more funding, which we'll get to later. In July of last year, the shed was broken into. Um, a large concrete block was thrown through one of the windows and nothing was taken but the inside was just kind of ransacked um, and we um, want to thank and call out Corey Jordan and Brian Parker in particular because they did a fantastic job of completely renovating the shed make uh, adding insulation repainting with all the graffiti that was on it adding the security to the windows replacing the window that was broken and um, doing a lot of work in there so just wanted to make sure they were mentioned and they're they're the from the building department so building they were department there. yes um we've like i said we've done a number of fundraising and awareness campaigns uh, on the left is a shot from our uh, city cemetery sprint the one mile race we do through the cemetery around halloween 
and then Cinema in the Cemetery, which we are doing again this year, and the movie will be Beetlejuice. So more information on that will be coming up. A number of years ago, we did um, kind of a triage and assessment of the vaults and what needed to be done in each vault. Obviously, you can see that SD vault right here is in dire need of repair. Um, and so they gave us a roadmap of how we should go about and start working on each of these vaults. And that was generously paid for by the city. And here is the vault that was completed last summer. It's a Christian's vault. And again, um, the original doors for all the vaults are actually inside each vault. So we have started a plan to bring them out, refinish them and put them back on. This whole vault was rebuilt. The only structure that was is still original is within the side of the hill. Kevin Vorstadt also recently finished a GIS mapping of damaged stones so that we can see easily and do a triage of what's fallen, what's leaning, what's broken. Um, and this he just completed. So this will be a huge help for us. And then these are the bollards. Uh, the bridge is no longer able to support vehicles. And currently, the, well, not currently because they were moved, but there were huge concrete blocks that were not uh, very aesthetically pleasing nor in keeping with the historic nature of the cemetery. So we just um, ordered these bollards and they are being put in today and tomorrow. So that's very exciting. In 2017, the cemetery won a Pride of Ownership Award from the City of Ithaca and the Rotary International Club here, uh, an award we are very proud of. So going forward, we're gonna need some help from the city for a couple of projects. And um, so we're gonna be asking for your interest and support in a number of ways. The first is that we want to have the cemetery designated as, as a park. Um, and that would open up more funding avenues. We need to figure out, uh, you know, capital monies to repair more of the vaults. Gene, in fact, had a meeting with a number of Masons today to get um, estimates on that. Not only is this a, a need to quickly shore up and, and preserve history, but it's also a safety issue. Um, we would like to get the road resurfaced, the roads resurfaced. Uh, they're just full of potholes at the moment. Uh, the main thoroughfare is actually a road, so that we're fine with having it remain um, paved. But the rest we would like just to be simple, you know, graded and pressed stone or something that um, would not be worn away in the same way that asphalt is. And that would also require, or no, we'd also ask that the asphalt be taken out of the original water drainage system, because that's one of the reasons we're getting um, major potholes. Uh, we are looking to do road signage within the cemetery. All of those roads actually have names. And so that would be great if uh, we could therefore uh, direct people more readily to where their friends or relatives are. The University Avenue wall is in deep need of repair. Again, that's a historical and a safety issue. And then we are looking to apply for National Underground Railroad Network to Freedom status as we have a number of people who are involved in the Underground Railroad and also National Wildlife Federation status. So why do we wanna be designated a park? Um, we are a public cemetery, municipal cemetery, and the assumption is that because of that, we can't do fundraising or get grants as you could for other uh, entities. These are just some questions, uh, you know, cemetery law, it's very exciting. <laughs> um, so if we were able to get designated a park, we could then apply for other monies. These are just some examples of the road surfaces. You can see uh, all the water is running down into this one area 
and is decimating the asphalt. And this is an example of the signage we're looking at. Um, just something, again, to help direct and increase the curb appeal of the cemetery. The University Avenue wall is one of the big issues, and we know that there have been plans for what to do with University Avenue. But as you can see, we have um, oops, a lot of stones that are falling over. We have the wall that's falling apart. That wall was built in the 1860s, and we would like to save it. Um, and so again, this is just something that is an aesthetic issue, but also a safety issue. And then, as I said, we, we want to apply for additional designations, which we'll need the support of the city for. And just to wrap it up, our next city cemetery cleanup, the kickoff is Monday, May 30th on Memorial Day, 9.30 a.m. to noon. You can come at any point. Um, please join us. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. And I just also want to promote Arbor Day. So we will be doing celebrating Arbor Day, which is April 29th, which I'm sure you all know what day is Arbor Day anyways, but I'll just tell you it's April 29th. And um, we'll be doing that in the city cemetery. We'll be planting a tree. So at 10 o'clock in the morning. So everyone's welcome to come. And then the following day, we are going to have a, a member of Cuga Bird Club do a birding tour in the cemetery on Saturday morning, um, April 30th. Does anyone have any questions about the cemetery or our work there or our plans there? George? Oh yeah, so Cynthia, George, and they, so I don't know who had their hand up first, but. Well, I was calling on George first. I saw his matter. hand. Oh, okay. Doesn't matter. Um, well, as I'm proud to say, Ellen is my uh, neighbor across the street on Hector Street. And uh, I think this is, I think this work is really, I think it's cool. Um, I have a couple of questions. Jean, is there a particular tree or one or two trees that are the oldest and biggest in the cemetery? Could there by any chance be an elm tree left in the cemetery? And uh, um, where do they bury all the uh, common council members? <laughs> We compost the council members, George. <laughs> <laughs> um, but probably, it's hard to say. Um, it's it's not always easy to guess the age of trees because so much of it is dependent on the site and how quickly they're growing. But probably what I would say is there's one um, white oak tree that's in kind of in the center of the cemetery and it is enormous. It is, um, I would consider it as like an old growth tree. It's several hundred years old. Um, we do have a picture um, from one of the intersections of the um, cemetery and it's labeled as such like what intersection it was at and I believe that tree is in the picture and this this photograph was from the early days of photographing it was probably in like the 1870s was when the picture was taken and the tree is there like it's younger much younger much smaller but I think it's there um, the other trees we have in the cemetery are um, hemlock trees which grow very slowly and so we have a number of sizable hemlock trees in the cemetery. Um, and those are probably, a lot of those are probably several hundred years old as well. How's the health of that white oak? It's, it's in great health. It's, yeah, it's in good shape. That's great. I would encourage uh, council colleagues to volunteer if you can on some of the cleanup dates uh, and to go on any of the uh, tours. Jean has conducted some really fascinating and very informative tours of the trees uh, to George's point uh, through the cemetery. So mm -hmm. consider going on those. Cynthia, I saw your hand up. Thank you. Um, I, I will say in my time first as liaison to the Parks Commission for the BPW and then liaison under Common Council, um, I have just been incredibly impressed by Ellen's commitment and dedication to the city cemetery, which has been steadfast in at least 13 years. Um, so uh, just the amount of resources and um, 
that she has been able to bring to the city uh, in repairing these these beautiful old stones and bringing uh, love and care to the park uh, and the cemetery is is just incredibly valuable. So thank you, uh, Ellen and Jean and Kristen for bringing this forward. Um, the, the first question I have as always is gonna be about process. Um, has this been brought to the Board of Public Works? Typically, uh, as you highlighted in your presentation, the cemetery comes under the purview of the Board of Public Works. They would be able to uh, evaluate and advise with regards to the benefits or considerations of turning the cemetery into a park um, from a, a public work standpoint. Um, I would recommend it go through the BPW and then presumably through PEDC, but they would be the first um, advisory group that would take a look at this. So I, I guess I'm looking to, um, to either Jean and, and Laura uh, with regards to process and the Board of Public Works. Yeah, I think that is something that we can have a conversation about. Um, this, as you'll recall, um, Cynthia has come up in previous years when Jean has made a presentation. So this will be a conversation to be continued. Yeah, I wonder also if getting um, someone from the planning department like Lisa or someone involved in that conversation as well would probably be helpful. Thank you. Well, I definitely would support um, I guess the, fixing the administrative category of the cemetery so that it can allow us as a city to, as you mentioned, uh, ap apply for grants, uh, work with nonprofits to fundraise for it, um, bring it the necessary infrastructure repairs that it needs. Um, so I definitely would, would support seeing this move forward in that way, um, but would look you, forward Cynthia. to the Board of Public yeah. Works to advise. Thank you. Um, Jorge, I see your hand up. Yeah, um, I just wanted to say that um, uh, I really appreciate this presentation. I don't really have a comment, just wanted to express um, thoughts of, uh, uh, I really learned a whole lot. If you saw my eye wandering, uh, it was to make sure to grab my friends to come out, out to this next uh, cleanup. Uh, mm -hmm. It seems like really good work. And uh, I, I learned a whole lot in this presentation alone. I'm, I'm looking forward to stopping by and, and hopefully learning more while writing a little bit of a helping hand. Great, definitely. The cleanup uh, efforts are both fun and very productive in restoring some of these incredible uh, grave markers. George, did you still have your hand up? Yeah, no, I have another question. Go right ahead. Um, one problem recently with going through the Board of Public Works is we haven't had a quorum in several months. Um, I'm wondering if, if Cornell might be interested in helping us with the cemetery maybe particularly the wall up um, at the top. I you know, I, I was remiss. I was trying to get everything in um, in a short amount of time because I also do <laughs> these kind of meetings and no, I don't wanna keep you guys too long. Um, but Cornell did uh, match the city's funds for repairing the vaults. Oh, good. Um, mm -hmm. As far as the wall up top, Possibly, I don't know. We haven't talked to them since we did the vaults. Um, so we'd have to, to go back and, and talk to them, but certainly the, the wall up top does need a lot of work done on it. Um, Just a thought. Yeah, that's a, that's a good thought, George. I will say that when I've shown up for the um, volunteer days, there have been in the past other uh, Cornell students volunteering. So the dates of the next cleanup are May 30th, I heard you say? Yes. So that 9.30 to noon, and we usually meet at the, uh, at the shed, which it's nice to see that renovated. It, they did a tremendous job on that. And, um, you know, it was odd to have the shed broken into, but people do stupid things in the cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but it did, it gave us the ability to, you know, Cody is very um, excited about doing work with us in the cemetery as well. So, or Corey, not Cody, sorry. 
Um, but yes, uh, Laura has been to many of our cleanup days and uh, you know, it's just the start of the season. We try to have one like once a month if we can. And again, we have, you know, cinema in the cemetery and tree tours and historic tours, and we will make sure to spam you with everything. <laughs> so. Um, wonderful, wonderful. In a nice Thanks way. Thanks so much. Are there any additional questions for Jean and the crew? Okay. Well, thank you for uh, the very informative presentation. Um, hope we have generated some volunteers for you, for additional volunteers for you for May 30th. Uh, I expect to see you that day and uh, appreciate your presentation tonight. Great. Well, and I saw Robert say it's in the best. Uh, yes. So best we'll point. see. <laughs> um, and at I also least, want to acknowledge. At least for the moment, yes. I want to acknowledge <laughs> Julie Johnson, of course, who's the other co founder of the group. Um, you know, she's just as dedicated and, uh, you know, puts a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into it, literally and figuratively. So, <laughs> yes, the other yeah, thing, I just, to, to. just to answer George uh, on another tree thing, is we've talked with um, NYSEG about maybe doing some nut trees in the cemetery that we can't do elsewhere, um, kind of heirloom trees that people would complain about all the nuts or different you know things but in the cemetery we can introduce things like that so um, we're looking at how we can use that space for you know doing bee studies and other stuff we've done before and if anyone is available to uh, recognize arbor day on april 29th yes. at 10 a.m there will be a tree planting um, so once again, thanks so much for the very informative presentation, responding to questions, and we look forward to seeing you on volunteer dates. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Jean. Thank you. Thank you for Bye. your time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we had talked, I had talked with Jean last year about uh, making a presentation. I think it has been gosh, at least three years since Jean has given a presentation to council and with so many new members, I thought it was appropriate uh, that we hear from Jean and all the good work they're doing. Uh, let's now turn to public comment. Um, I understand Julie as always has that in good order. Uh, so Julie, who is our first speaker. Our first speaker is Marcella Troy. Marcella will be followed by Lee Adler. Um, you'll have three minutes. I won't interrupt you. I hope you'll track your own time. I'll try not to interrupt you while you're speaking, but I will let you know when the three minutes is uh, done. Thank you, so Marcella, Marcella. Whenever can... you're ready. Are you, are you there, Marcella? Is Marcella in the waiting room? I had just promoted her in, but maybe. Uh, let me ask to Should unmute. we go to our next speaker and then we can always circle back to Marcella? Sure. Um, sure. So why don't we start then with Lee Adler and Marcella, you will follow Lee after that. Let me um, get. Lee will be joining us in just a second. Thank you, Julie, for managing this. Oh, I just see Marcella connecting to audio. And I do not see Lee yet. Is that Lee? Are you there, Lee?
Are you there, Marcella? Um, do I join as a pa panelist? Is that a, what I push? Or? Yes. Yep. That's what you click. Am I supposed I mean, to we start? Can, we can hear you, Lee. So if you'd oh. like to start, please go right oh, ahead. Okay. okay, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Well, now uh, we can see you as well. Hi, Lee. Hi, Laura. <laughs> um, I may have to go off because I, I was afraid of the three minutes and I wrote everything out, which I don't normally do. And I have to look down to the Word document. So please excuse me. Um, I don't mean to be rude that way, but I'll look down to the Word document now. Um, Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Lee Adler, and uh, I'm a faculty member at the ILR School, uh, a practicing lawyer um, who represents the Ithaca Firefighters the last 20 years and five other municipalities up and down state. My background is as a civil rights and union lawyer for 20 plus years representing the NAACP and coal mine workers and teachers and their unions in the southern West Virginia coal fields. I teach the study of public sector labor law that critically deconstructs the power relationships that exist between governing bodies like the city and its uniform officers. Earlier uh, around in 2020, I unsuccessfully sought committee membership because I was feeling uh, deeply from the outset uh, of the uh, events that took place in our country that the rhetoric and national projections coming from responsible and irresponsible members of our community um, uh, were, uh, worry, were, were things that worried me. And th those worries increased when it became clear that the earlier um, incarnation of the task force uh, would rely upon so-called data experts and national think tank types that would advance uh, public safety in uh, one dimensional and national ways and not necessarily relevant to our community. I feared and I believe that more division has resulted from uh, that phenomena. Uh, most of America and I agree that marginalized community members way too often receive unfair treatment from certain members of our police forces. I also agree that our police unions too often uncritically represent or take positions, un uncritically represent a member who the community believes is in the wrong uh, or takes positions that the community strongly disagrees with. But the report from this uh, task force uh, at this juncture uh, with the work of the police is where I believe it comes up short. Two of the most danger inducing police concepts and activities um, they ignore is that the law in New York State describes police units as paramilitary in nature and people, meaning police, are trained as if they're going to war. That is a design of New York State and it's, in, it's encrusted in public sector, public collective bargaining law. Um, police are trained that if when attacked, if you don't do something first, then the others will. And unless and until we deal with the community harmful structural problems like this, whether you hire a commissioner or add 17 mental health workers uh, to take care of our um, uh, more vulnerable communities, this danger to our community will continue. Thank you, Lee, that's your three minutes. Um, you can feel free to submit the rest of your comments uh, to Common Council through the public comment cards if you'd like to, and then we can append it to the minutes of this meeting. Oh, I think a lot of my time got shortened because uh, I had timed it. So, well, thank okay. you, Lee. Thank you, but please do submit your full comments to us, your written comments. And how do I do that, Laura? Uh, you can just send it to Common Council. Uh huh. At, at City, I have your email address, Lee. I'll send you an email. Okay, and then I can just send the, the final comment. Okay, I just have two more paragraphs, so I'll do it that way. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Marcella, are you online now? Uh, 
I saw trying to get connected to audio earlier. Marcella, can you hear us? Julie, let's move on to the next speaker then. Okay. So our next speaker is Dean Zervos, and after Dean will be Teresa Alt. And we'll keep trying to come back to pick up Marcella. Thank you. Hello, Dean. Hello, Dean. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Now. Yes, go ahead, please. Your three minutes will start. Hi, my name is Dean Zervos. I have owned Simeon's on the Commons since 2007. I've been a proud resident of Ithaca, raised my, both my children here. They both went to RHS and graduated. Uh, since I've owned Simeon's, we've had some tragedy, as everyone knows, and we've had a lot of great times. I have, um, speaking on behalf of a lot of my employees right now, because I have about 35 employees and I should have about 10 to 15 more, but uh, we're having a problem hiring people because a lot of people keep saying, I'm, I'm afraid to go down to town. I'm afraid to walk to my car at night. I'm afraid to leave here and what's gonna happen to me when I'm going to the garage. There is no police presence on the commons anymore. And it really is becoming a problem. We really have to start looking at this because the police force has been tremendously um, sh shrink. Has sh I'm sorry. We've seen a lot of growth in Ithaca, and there's been a lot of enthusiasm towards downtown's revitalization um, since about 2020. In 2020, we started to see less police presence and more rhetoric from the mayor's office about um, how to get rid of the police and not help them out. The mayor has done everything in his power, the previous mayor has done everything to promote his own agenda in the future and not worrying about us here in Ithaca. He's gone now. It's really time for us to start making a dent in hiring more police force, getting a chief of police and getting this city back to the safety that the people in it really want. So thank you very much. I appreciate the time. Have thank you, Dean. Thank you. You're welcome. Marcella, are you available now? Unfortunately, I think we'll have to move on to the next speaker. Okay, so our next speaker is Teresa Alt, and following Teresa is, and I, I apologize if I don't pronounce your name correctly, Celie Gladstein. Hi, Teresa. Hi, I'm Teresa Alt, 206 Eddy Street, College Town. I'm concerned that you are setting up the Division of Community Solutions for Failure. They would be useful in maybe half of the incidents that the police now attend to. That's a guess, that half is a guesstimate from looking at the report in Appendix C. Now, there are 63 police officers and two dogs, yet the police say they don't have enough, and you want to employ only five community responders. How will they handle half of that caseload? Moreover, at the suggested community responder yearly salary of about 57,000, each could afford up to 1,425 in monthly rent, 30%. They may not be able to have more than a studio or one bedroom apartment in the city. What if a responder has a family and needs a larger apartment? I happen to have heard of an analogous fiasco here in Ithaca. We hear how we are starting to provide supportive housing for people with various difficulties. Yet I hear of an agency that is supposed to have seven staffers supporting the support, supportive housing up from six, but at this point, three have left. So there are only three on staff. So the workload for those three balloons out of control and more and more of the staffers quit, leaving the situation in a death spiral. 
now back to the community responders, the future. When five responders, all rookies by definition, can't handle what 30 police officers and a dog do, then what? The public will declare them a failure. Will you respond by ending the experiment? Is that the plan? Please don't count on miracles. Fund a good idea adequately. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Our next speaker is Celie Gladstein following, um, Celie is Tim Holland. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hi, um, so um, I am here uh, regarding an issue that was brought up last at last month's meeting um, about Southside's concerns uh, and needs for a janitor. Um, I just want to make sure this issue is getting the attention that it deserves. Um, I spoke with the executive director at Southside to find out, you know, what their needs were and how things were going. And uh, it looks like, you know, they have a maintenance person a couple times a week, um, but no janitor. So my understanding is not, I don't fully understand. It's a city owned building. So I guess that that means they need to have city employees doing this work, but there's not a janitor available to them at this time. Um, it is somewhat concerning because there's so many kids and youth um, there. The space is a safe space for them and it, and it needs to be cleaned regularly. Um, I'm wondering what is going, is happening in regards to this, what the common council is going to do to help them get what they need. Um, maybe someone can explain to me how this works in terms of the city requirements around this. Um, that is my main issue at this time. Um, so I, yeah, that, that's, that's what I'm looking to hear about what, what's, what's being done about this issue. Thank you, Celie. There will be opportunity at the end of public comment for responses from council members. We don't engage in a back and forth, but if there is an update, we'll be sure to provide you. Okay, actually, while I'm on, and it's also about Southside, I, I was told that this meeting was going to be addressing some issues of funds being withheld from Southside. And so I'd also like to add that to my um, concern because they don't Thank know you. what funds are being held. Without. Thank you, Celie. Thank you. Um, thank next... you. Yeah, our next speaker is Tim Holland. Following Tim, I see that um, Marcella is back in, so we'll try that again. Thank you. Hi, Tim. Are you there? Hi, yes. Uh, my name is Tim Holland. <clears throat> uh, I retired from the Ithaca Police Department on June 29th, 2021. Uh, I retired with a little over 17 years. I hastily bought three years off of my retirement um, with my military service credit uh, because I was nervous about the status of my civil service. Um, I would like to put that into a little bit of context for you all <clears throat> uh, in the form of a dollar amount. Um, so I'm 53 and for the rest of my life, uh, I could spend all day every day laying on the couch and I will make 3,500 a month <clears throat> in retirement. I don't know what y'all's retirements look like, but for me, that amount is concerning. <clears throat> uh, phone numbers, if you were so inclined to speak with the New York State Civil Service Office or the New York State Retirement Office, those phone numbers are easily found online. Uh, I have spoken to both, and um, the answer from both when I've run my concerns by them is we'll have to wait and see. And that answer enough that answer was enough to uh, send me to the exit. Um, I have two questions. I suppose I'll ask them rhetorically unless someone has a really quick answer. Uh, the first question is, let's say, since January of 2020, 
Uh, I'm just wondering if any of you have spoken to a human being in either the civil service or retirement office, anybody. As I said, Tim, this is not a time for a back and forth. We're happy to hear your comments. Okay, my second question uh, is kind of along the lines of human resources. <clears throat> so it appears reimagining is about to reach implementation stage. Um, so naturally there's gonna come a time in the future where people are going to need to be hired. So on the armed personnel side, uh, um, when it comes to advertising for those jobs or recruiting for those jobs, how, I mean, are, are they still gonna be called police officers or are they gonna be called public safety officers? Um, that's my question. Um, I could be wrong on this date, um, but it was roughly early or late 20, 19, early 2020, Cynthia Brock sent a letter or an email to IPD at large, where among other things, she ensured us that our civil service status would be safe. My question is, how, how do you know that? How do any of you know that? Um, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Tim, but your three minutes is up. Okay, thank you for your Thank time. you, Tim. Thanks for your comments and your questions. Okay, uh, next we'll ask Marcella to unmute and um, speak. And after Marcella will be John O'Leary. Marcella, can you hear us now? Hi, Marcella, are you there? It appears there are still some audio issues. Uh, let's move on to John O'Leary. I, I will just say, Marcella, if you can hear us, you certainly can submit your comments in writing to Common Council, as can any of tonight's speakers. But right now, let's turn to John O'Leary. And following John will be Nick Domster. Hi, John. Can you hear us? John, are you out there? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Right ahead. All right. I'm new to the Zoom thing, so I apologize. That's okay. Uh, thank you for uh, taking the time to listen to me. Um, you know, as business owners down, especially down on Aurora Street, the commons area, uh, we all talk very much. Uh, in fact, we all got together last night, you know, just not to be redundant in our in our comments to this meeting. Um, so I hope March can get un, unmuted at some point. Um, so, you know, obviously we're concerned with this imagining uh, campaign. Uh, I'm sorry, I just got some notes over here. But, you know, I think it's important to, to really think about so quickly. You know, I've been doing, I've been uh, in business in Ithaca for 25 years. I've been different parts of Ithaca. I've been down on the West End. I've been in College Town. Now I'm, you know, still down on Aurora Street, technically State Street since we moved. But the important thing I think to uh, consider when you're considering this, this, this change, which I'll be frank, I don't support. Um, I mean, these, these are people that took time to get education, training, very important training. I've enjoyed at least 23 years of complete support and safety, having, knowing that I have IPD, at, you know, anytime. And it's really, you know, and I, I think any, all of you have looked at the statistics and see how it's dropped off. You know, I never understood not supporting them with a contract. I thought that was ridiculous. Um, but you know, the thing is that it, it's about safety. It's about responsibility. You know, us as business owners, of course we have our responsibilities. We have responsibilities to pay taxes. We have responsibility to our employees who are also extended the families in this community. They go, their kids go to school. You know, I personally have 57 employees and you know, and it can really scare you. You can wake up in the middle of the night wondering, you know, it's a big responsibility is what I'm trying to say uh, of knowing that you are the one 
that are taking care of these families. And it's a, it was a very comforting feeling to know that I always had support in this community, especially from the police, to back me up if there was ever a problem. Um, and, and it's very apparent, you know, and you, you see, you know, you, everybody loves to read the articles about Ithaca being the emergent city and the best place to retire, you know, all these things, you know, and that's strongly based on the past 20 plus years of a very low crime rate, a very well trained and uh, um, 134 years of this police department and very, very well trained and, and they have stick together like a brother and they work together and they work with the community. I enjoy seeing the police walk down the street, you know, and, you know, and, you know, Lee Adler made some, some militant comments and that's fine if that's what he believes. I don't believe we see that in Ithaca. I think they have always been a huge help in the community. I've seen them talk to tourists, which is obviously a huge revenue system in this, in this city, especially in the summertime, you know, when the, the students are gone. And thanks, and, John, your three minutes has been reached. Okay. Thank you, John. I'll submit the rest in writing. Thanks, that would be great. Uh, next up is Nick Domster, and following Nick will be Heather Campbell. Hi, Nick, are you there? Yes, good evening, can you hear me? Yes, yes. speak up just okay, a little bit if you don't mind. Uh, sorry, I'm also um, working with a couple other things. Uh, so I'll try and be quick. Uh, first, I wanna say Officer Holland, it was great to see you again. Uh, and it was also awesome to work alongside you. Thank you for your service. Uh, and thank you for protecting me. Uh, I am, I am, excuse me, I am Nick Domster. I proudly represent Bank Daniel in Ithaca, New York. I've served your community and now I call my community for coming up to 17 years now. I'm a Buffalo native. I lived in Indiana, around Gary, Indiana and Chicago, uh, Illinois for 13 years of my life as well, uh, just before moving here. Uh, I've seen my share of violence, though I've learned a lot moving into this area. Uh, and serving uh, as a EMT and paramedic now uh, as a supervisor for Bangs Ambulance. I will first start by saying I will wholeheartedly support IPD and behind them every step of the way as they stand in front of me every single time I have called for their assistance. Um, and with that, I will speak with the work that I am involved in in this community is a vital part that IPD uh, is involved with that as well. Uh, allowing me to perform that work safely. Uh, sorry, I'm not much of a public speaker, so I'm trying to read off what I, I made notes of. Uh, IPD, just like any other service, police service has uh, protects other essential services in the Ithaca area. Uh, without their ability to do so, uh, to do to de-escalate uh, a potentially dangerous situation, uh, people like or services like EMS and fire will not be able to safely reach someone in need. Uh, and now with the ever escalating shootings and stabbings that we seem to be having almost every weekend now, uh, IP service is needed now, now more than ever. That escalating crime needs to be with be met with an increased presence of authority. Secondly, I'll advocate for their, uh, excuse me, they advocate for our community members. I cannot tell you how many times I've seen IP sincere compassion reach most of our most desperate and vul uh, vulnerable neighbors. Many times it seems that, seems that passion has gone further and deeper with that person than the care that they get later on that day. I've seen that with mental health patients as well as even the most desperately, severely addicted people. Uh, I've seen those bonds created and those friendships started with those interactions. Uh, and with those, I couldn't imagine where some of those people would be today if they didn't have that officer advocating for them. Uh, it's a slippery slope to consider removing or shrinking of the police force. Uh, oh, excuse me. Um, uh, in, in my only comparison to that is that would be like removing the locks and doors from your own house. Some may be comfortable with that, but I am certainly not. Uh, that leaves a community I serve uh, open to unwanted guests. Really, that is all I have to say right now, but they are, IPD is a vital role in my safety. Removing them or limiting them takes away from my safety as well. And as I, I serve the community. Uh, so that would stretch 
across the board. It's not affecting just the police department, but it's affecting the community, the community safety, and the business and businesses and thriving businesses in the area. So that's all I have to say. Thank you, Nick. Thanks much. Um, up next is Heather Campbell. Following Heather will be Rocco Lucente. Hi, are you able to hear me? Yes, yes we hear you. Um, thank you. My name is Heather Campbell. I am the executive director of the Advocacy Center, the agency providing services for victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, and child sexual abuse. And we've been following the work of the reimagining public safety very closely. We work closely with survivors who are engaged with the criminal justice system, with survivors who choose not to engage with the criminal justice system, and with survivors who have been harmed by their contact with the system. We work with local law enforcement to support safety for victims of abuse. We also support the work in our community to build new options outside of the criminal justice system and building new tools for survivors of domestic and sexual violence, tools that will help build accountability for those who harm and safety for those who are harmed, and tools that go beyond our current um, really single tool for accountability and safety, which is the criminal justice system right now. I often say it's like we have a toolbox with only hammers in it, and we need a more diverse toolbox of support for survivors and accountability um, methods for survivors in our community. However, we do have some concerns about the ways that domestic violence and child abuse case response is being framed in some of the community conversations. We have concerns about some of the broad language being used to talk about domestic violence and child abuse. For example, we're hearing domestic violence frequently described as domestic disputes. It's actually been 20 years or more since I've heard this term used as often. A dispute is a disagreement or an argument. Domestic violence is a pattern of coercive behavior that is used to gain or maintain power and control over an intimate partner. There are calls to law enforcement that are disputes, disagreements, but it minimizes the very lethal risk of domestic violence to categorize domestic violence as a domestic dispute and to not differentiate and plan for the real safety risks involved when responding to domestic violence. In the discussions about alternative responses to domestic violence, I'm also often hearing domestic violence linked to mental health calls. This is a dangerous misunderstanding about the, the dynamics of domestic violence. It also un unintentionally reinforces, I think, some of the myths that people with mental health um, are more likely to be dangerous, where in fact, they're more likely to be victims of crime. But a mental health response is not an appropriate or safe response for domestic violence. We believe it's critically important for our community to be talking about alternative responses to domestic violence and sexual violence, particularly in cases where the survivor does not want law enforcement involvement. However, an unarmed response alone without building other tools and resources in our community to support accountability and safety is not a safe response. We hope that these conversations continue and that we can start to support a more nuanced conversation about interventions for both domestic violence and child abuse and start looking at what these other um, alternative responses could look like in our community to increase safety for everyone. We think it's critically important that when we're talking about survivors, that we need to be actually centering the voices of survivors in these conversations, and particularly the voices of BIPOC and queer survivors who have been most impacted by the criminalization of the response to gender-based violence. In this reimagining process, our agency has not yet been consulted or brought into these conversations about responses to abuse, and we sincerely hope that our expertise will be utilized as these conversations move forward. We are really eager to be a part of building a more safe and just community. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Heather. Uh, next up is Rocco Lucente. Following Rocco is Ana Ortiz. Hello, my name is Rocco Lucente. I'm a fourth generation Ithaca native and the host of the YouTube show Ithaca Uncensored. There are many people here tonight to speak out against the Ithaca Police Reimagining proposal. And as I'm sure you can correctly guess, I also am opposed to it. That being said, my message tonight is a different one from theirs. I come to bring somber news to those individuals. The effort to neuter IPD has succeeded. We have already lost. These activists who do not have your good or the community's good in mind when they seek to abolish IPD have already won. We've seen the numbers in the field of officers nearly halved. We have seen some of the best and most senior officers retire explicitly because of this process. We've seen violent crime more than double. We've seen officers routinely unable to respond to calls due to staffing issues. And we've seen officers ordered by city governments to not defend the civil rights of those who the city government opposes politically on multiple occasions. 
The only question at this point is how long will that victory last before the community finally wakes up and sees what is clearly in front of our faces? This process is being led by some sick people who seek to subjugate the community not to improve it. There is a very simple, utterly destructive goal at play for the activists in charge here. Get the police out of the way so that business owners and community members have nobody to turn to in the face of the communist mob. The mob can then resort to illegal means to defend criminals against being evicted, against being arrested for shoplifting, and will enable them to participate in other forms of lawlessness. We will live under a dystopian society, the likes of which we have seen time and time again throughout history. Instead of a peace officer arresting the criminal on the basis of specific charges, the mob will intimidate you into letting the criminal go using bullying tactics and threats. The helplessness you will feel in the face of this crime is the goal. Mob rule, it, rule is the ultimate form of totalitarian control. The police are the only hope city residents have of maintaining their freedom. In the absence of a strong Ithaca Police Department, freedom will only be a riot away from extinction. The freedom-loving citizens of the Ithaca area will be speaking out against this throughout the spring, summer, and fall. We will not be intimidated by mobs like the Ithaca DSA, no matter how many common council members they elect, no matter how many times city government prevents IPD from responding to our cries for help as we are being attacked by the communist mob, as has happened multiple times in the past. We will not be intimidated into silencing our voices, and we are here to let the city government know that we are not asking you to respect our equal rights. We are demanding it. Two years of local government totalitarianism has awoken a sleeping giant, and that sleeping giant will make itself known throughout 2022. Type Ithaca is not safe anymore into YouTube to learn more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rocco. Uh, I don't see uh, Anna in our list here. Um, so our next speaker will be Sarah Hess, and following Sarah will be David Bowers. Hello, my name is Sarah Hess. I live on the West Hill of Ithaca, and I'm here to urge approval for the new public safety plans. I do not want to eliminate police. I want the IPD to be better and more effective. I've lived in Ithaca for 47 years, raised my kids here, worked in education and youth services, and I've seen some of the attempts at improving police services during that time. One of those was creating community police officers back in the 90s. A couple of officers were assigned to learn more about community services. They built relationships with neighborhood leaders and were visible and helpful at GX, South Sides, and schools. The idea was to build trust and to identify problems early before they turned into crimes. The idea only lasted a few years, however, in large part because it went against the culture of police. The culture has been much discussed in this whole process of reimagining safety. Other officers felt that the community police were being paid to be friendly neighbors, basically on vacation, while real policing, the serious and dangerous jobs were left to them. The same concept of changing the culture of public safety is attempted in this plan. And fortunately, with a lot more time, research, money, and some examples from other cities that we can help see will help us in implementing our plans. Will it work better? I certainly hope so. I do believe in prevention and there's not nearly enough of it happening. Locally, I also think there's a longstanding problem in who gets promoted and who doesn't at IPD. And that's another part of the culture that needs to change. I remember one officer, Brad Nelson, many of you know him, who made comments at one of the town hall meetings last year. He was so choked up recalling the disrespect and lack of promotions which he had earned but not received that he could hardly speak. I believe there are many other current and former officers who share this experience, and this also is a problem that must be solved. As to whether or not a new commissioner specifically to oversee the IPD is necessary, that I don't know. 
but I do know that crime prevention and solving crimes is far more difficult without widespread community trust and support. And in many community neighborhoods or within uh, populations, that trust and support is not considered to be felt. A new commissioner could make a big difference. Thank you and thank you. My thanks go to all the people, many, many people who helped to create this plan. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I don't see David in the waiting room either. So our next speaker will be Lenny um, and following Lenny will be Alejandro Santana. Hi Lenny, are you there? I am, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, go ahead. All right, I just wanted to talk briefly about the uh, crisis uh, people that uh, IPD relies on when they have situations that uh, they need an extra person or extra, extra expertise. Um, just the other day, we had an incident in the morning time down in Ithaca where a individual was holding a uh, box cutter to his throat and IPD requested for them to uh, make contact and they outright refused to um, come to the scene. You know, this is just one of many, many incidences that uh, IPD has had to de-escalate themselves because of the uh, negotiators um, refusing to come to the scene. Another one that comes to mind was the uh, jumper that they had at the uh, parking garage downtown. Um, and again, IPD had to rely on their own expertise uh, to be able to talk that person off the ledge. Um, I mean, if they are this ineffective with the job that they're supposed to be doing in support of IPD, why do we even have them? And not to mention the fact that, uh, you know, if I was at a job and I told my boss that I refused to do something, I would almost immediately be written up or fired on the spot for insubordination. So, I mean, where's the accountability for this, uh, you know, this group of people that are supposed to be mental health um, professionals and, and whatnot? Um, yeah, I just wanted to bring some attention to that because it's been happening a lot more lately, you know, and again, to reiterate, you know, the uh, incline of uh, shots fired calls, a murder that happened just uh, two weeks ago or so, um, you know, we need to rely on IPD more now than ever. And uh, you guys need to step up your game and, and, figure out where the deficiencies are and fix what the problem is before it gets any worse. That's all I have. Thank you. Uh, next speaker, is that Alejandro? Alejandro and uh, Alejandro will be followed by Deeps. Alejandro, are you there? Yes, I am. Okay, go ahead, please. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Alejandro Santana, and I've been an Ithaca resident for 22 years now. And I'm, I'm, my point is about the reimagining the public safety. And I think um, he has some great ideas, but it is to focus on capturing the national attention and isn't sufficiently based on the local realities of the community in Ithaca. We have a unique economy and population here in Ithaca. And just because something might work elsewhere, doesn't necessarily mean is the best idea for our community. Concretely, I think reimagining public safety initiative should be escalated back to focus on three achievables measurements. First, we need to better train and equip the police force in mental health and de-escalation to peacefully address a wide range of situations, 
This will require more investment in police training to ensure that they can better serve the community. Next, the police must become more engaged with the public police officers to feel like members of the community, a part of the daily life, which they are. This will help both the law enforcement and the general community because community members will feel more comfortable relying on the police for help. And the police will have a better understanding of what the people in the community know or want. And I don't think we should discuss the, discount the importance of both community members and the law enforcement feeling safer because their trust, respect, and emphasis with one another. Part of the accomplishing this will re, this reorganization of the way of the police operate. The police department should be divided into more units with different roles in the community and should look for more ways to incorporate civilians community members into a variety of flexible roles. For a community to prosper, grow, and be happy, the most important thing is to feel safe in a place where you strive, to, you live, you get your education, and then you progress. Crime and violence in our community only leads to one question. How much can our authority do to regain our city back from crime and insecurity? Public safety needs more resources, more police presence, more police awareness, and more importantly, community engagement in order to make our community safer. And finally, reimagining public safety can only be achieved if its goals remain grounded in what, in what the actual people in the community want, as opposed to what the most nationally popular ideas might be. To do this, we need to consort, consult focus groups and in different interest segments of the population for which we can gather the best ideas for our citizens and get an understanding of what the different group, groups, stakeholders is or need. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alejandro, thank you. Our next speaker is Deeps and Deeps will be followed by Belisa Gonzalez. Makes sense. Hi Deeps, go ahead. Hey, uh, can you all hear me? Yes, thank you. Uh, hey everyone, uh, my name is Deeps. I'm a resident of Ward 5. I've spoken to most of you already in multiple capacities at this point. But today I, I just kind of wanted to bump what uh, Teresa and Lee Adler were saying earlier uh, and urge the Common Council to treat the Reimagining Public Safety Working Group's recommendations as a, a mere baseline, the bare minimum, if you will. Uh, I think that uh, personally, the Working group's recommendation doesn't really go far enough to address the issues, uh, the underlying issues here. Um, and I think we've heard a lot from a bunch of like white small business owners today uh, about like supporting the IPD. I think that that is nothing more than a very vocal minority. We haven't really heard anything from Ithaca's communities of like black or indigenous or other people of color who do exist and who have been and continue to be on the end of most negative experiences with the IPD. Um, I think in that regard, if the point of public safety is to ostensibly to make the public feel safer, then IPD has consistently failed in that regard, especially when it comes to people who look like me. Um, and I'm from, uh, I grew up in, in the Willamette Valley in Oregon. I have been there. I've seen uh, the CAHOOTS program, which is uh, Eugene, Oregon's Reimagining Public Safety equivalent. Uh, they've been operating since 1989, and they are extremely successful at what they do. They uh, handle a significant portion of all 911 calls made to the city of Eugene for a fraction of the cost. Uh, and I think like those are the benefits that the city accrues from uh, reimagining public safety, apart from just having more trust in the government from the people that it claims to represent in general, 
so in on on that in that regard, I think that creating sort of an unarmed task force with only five responders is a, is too little. I think that's I think that's too little, and I think that's detrimental to the viability of the project in general. Like Teresa was saying. It seems like you guys are setting up this uh, division of community solutions to fail right from the get-go, right? Because five people is not going to be enough to respond to all of the uh, all of the calls that that they can handle um, without like also calling for armed backup. We spoke to the uh, working group and they insinuated that if the five people weren't going to weren't enough to handle calls, those calls would then be forwarded to just regular armed IPD officers, which defeats the purpose of the reimagining public safety working group in general. So I think that if you do want this project to succeed, I do applaud that effort. I, I applaud the uh, the move towards progressivism that the city council is trying to is trying to go through. But I think that if you want this project to succeed, you should be treating this uh, recommendation as a mere baseline. We have to be doing more to fund uh, the Division of Community Solutions. Thank you. I think that's my time. Thank you very much. Uh, next is Belisa Gonzalez. Following Belisa is Patricia Fernandez de Castro. Hi, good evening. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. I feel like we got to start with that. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, so I'm going to be reading. Apologies for not looking um, at everyone. So, um, like I said, my name is Belise Gonzalez. I am a professor at Ithaca College. I am also a 15 year resident of the city of Ithaca, um, raising my family here. And, um, and I'm here as a community member as well. And as someone who worked alongside Betty, dedicated, overworked and underappreciated people to gather and analyze data for the reimagining public safety report. Like many people, I was skeptical of the process. I thought that this process would be like so many before where we asked uh, the most marginalized amongst us to tell their stories, to relive their traumas in the name of data collection and then ultimately dismiss what they were brave enough to tell us. And I fear that that's what's happening. That we would ask folks who, who work for the city and the county to add yet another thing to their plates in order to add legitimacy to the process. That it would all be a setup in the end, like some of the folks before me have said, because the voices, that trauma, all of the overtime hours that were worked that were not spent with family, that were not spent with friend and the friends were, that were not spent at rest, which folks deserve, would be in vain. That despite an executive order that specifically told us to center the most marginalized voices, we would end up back here at a zero sum frame where we either listen to one group or another. I'm here to tell you that it is not either or, but both and. And we have a job, you have a job as council members, and that is to listen and lift up the most marginalized um, amongst us. And so you should ask yourself at every stage of this process, what have you done to lift up, to listen to, to sit with the realities of those folks who gave us the gift, and it was a gift of sharing their stories, their experiences with us. What have you done to center these voices? That's my time. Thank you, Belisa. Uh, next up is Patricia and following Patricia will be Anna Ortiz. Hi, Patricia, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes. My name is Patricia Fernandez de Castro. I've been living in, this, uh, in Tompkins County uh, for the past 22 years. And I am the president of the Latino Civic Association of Tompkins County. Um, dear members of the Common Council, I am pleased to convey the support of the Latino Civic Association of Tompkins County for the reimagining public safety report recently delivered to the Common Council. The LCA is an all vol volunteer 501c3k C3 and the oldest Latino organization in the county. Our mission is to provide a vehicle for the social, cultural, educational, and civic exp expression of the Latino community in Tompkins County to facilitate access to local institutional resources and promote self-reliance, to develop programs and services that strengthen our Latino heritage and promote cultural pride, and to work for the betterment and cultural development of the larger community and foster mutual understanding and respect among all persons in Tompkins County. The LCA welcomes the recommendations presented in the Reimagining Public Safety Report, 
which supports reclaiming community oversight, reforming accountability, and reimagining public safety, issues that are of particular interest and importance to the members of the Latinx community in Tompkins County. The Latinx population of Tompkins County and of the region has been growing at a consistently rapid pace since 1990. Despite undercounting Latinos, the 2020 census data indicate it is currently the most dynamic ethnic um, and racial group in, the, in most counties in the region, including in Tompkins County. The Latinx community is also amongst the most impacted by policing and the criminal justice system. Our people have historically experienced marginalization and discrimination, especially from those who are called to provide us with safety and peace. That is why we are very impressed and pleased with the work done by the Reimagining Public Safety Working Group in shaping a collective response to the root causes that have left, led to numerous fatal and unfortunate events in our country. The innovative idea of change in creating a new department of community safety led by a civilian commissioner gives us a sense of hope by providing the possibility of including members of our community as agents of change. This reasonable change, this reasonable, this reasonable change will also carry us to the, that sense of safety where we can start rebuilding trust and eventually lead us towards a more socially just community. As a member of the Latinx community of Tompkins County and on behalf of the Latino Civic Association of Tompkins County, I respectfully ask you, the members of the Common Council, to approve the Reimagining Public Safety Report. We understand that this change is needed by, for creating the momentum that will move us a step closer to a place of equity, justice, and trust. Thank you very much. Could you hear me? Yes, we could. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Doc, there might be something wrong with City Hall's internet access, which I think puts you in charge. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think you're right, since Julie and, uh, and Laura dropped off. Let me uh, just see if it's still on YouTube. Anna Ortiz, if you're there, um, it's your turn to speak. Hi, Anna. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. So my name is Anna Ortiz. I Oh, my name is Ann Ortiz. I represent the uh, No Mas Lagima, No More Tears, West Village community and people in the community. Um, plus, um, my No Mas Lagimas is starting doing a Latino center that is not just not provide only Latino, just people in the community. So I'm here and represent West Village and any people they are going in the community. Um, and one thing that I wanted to say is I'm against the, the other stuff. I want the police back in business because um, people in the community, they start. My apologies, people, Anna. Yeah. Yeah. everyone. Okay. We at City Hall have been losing our wife. Can I continue? I'm oh, sorry, Anna. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so um what to say is like right now I'm by myself, I'm at the center, but um people in the community they stop by and I can tell you probably I'm by myself right now, but I can say behind me it can be a uh, ten people, it can be a hundred people, it can be a thousand people. Because as a single mom they're having this issue going on in the community. Like for example, some shooting happening at the West Village, some shooting happening at the Plain Street, some um, chasing. Mm 
my or my yeah, apologies wanna... to uh, apologies to I'm sorry. I'm I'm on. City okay. Wall having internet problems. You can just push through. Well, uh, to yeah, room. I'm going to start by Juliet. Probably you had to give me some coffee or hot chocolate because I'm cold over here. Anyway, for my internet problem. Uh, my con no, the concern in the community happening is right now is like we not feel safe right now in, the, in, 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 in our local Itika community right now because. One of the concerns the family have is like, not too long ago, it was some chasing going to Cayuga High Elementary School. And the half of the rest of the kids from West Village. Jesus Christ. Well, they had to, Jesus. I don't want to curse. <laughs> Let me know when you are, baby. There we We're go. Still on, and you can you can wrap up, um, finish up your comments. Apologies for okay. the disruptions. Right now, like one of the people in the community very concerned about children they cannot be outside, not even pray when their own children, the kids or the neighbors around in the community because they not feel safe. And we need to need to get back to police and get the stuff together. And then please come in council. You know what I mean? I don't have no issue with you personally or not of people in the community. But please, St. Panami started. You not even bring a gallon of milk to our family. At least do something about it. Like I say, I have some concern in the city hall. You know, just put everybody's the shit together and do something in the community because. So I just want to see, like, for me, it's like, I do not need to have to be having no signature. I think the work that no mas and the and the, my, the partners that I'm by my side, been working for a long time, like they know what we're doing. And then we are very concerned. It's like, I need to go to sleep. I need to, Take care of my community, and not worry about my son or my daughter get shoot, get shot, or stabbing in downtown. The the people that my kids they born here, and a lot of parents they're very concerned. It's like they want the kids safe, and wanted. To and um. Okay. Here. I gave you some extra time because of the problems, but um, I know, the past three like, minutes, so if you could wrap up, I'd appreciate it. I know, I know. I'm, I'm gonna have to go to City Hall. They got, they had to owe me some hot chocolate because it's like, yes. Okay. Thanks, Anna. We appreciate your comments. Yeah, yeah. If anything, you know, I'm here and um, I'm trying to. There's a lot of concern going on and, you know what I mean? And I'm trying to be back in the business and then, you know what I mean? There we go. So I will appreciate, you know, our safety for our community. And then I will impersonally, if there's something wrong or something, you know what I mean? I wanted to help. No matter like my, any partnership and stuff. My, a lot of parents very concerned about our safety. And Thanks, I need, that's, that's your time. Man. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I'm gonna keep stalling for time while City Hall continues to uh, get out of their internet issues, and so um, I think we're gonna move on to privilege of the floor. Um, I do want to say something, but I will go last. And so, if there's anyone else who would like to speak, unless Laura, you're back. Yes, I'm back, but again, uh, your apologies that the connectivity issues in, in City Hall are problematic tonight. 
um, and I'm not sure why. Um, any response to the public? Cynthia? Um, I know that we are going to be talking about uh, many of the proposals that are in front of us later on in the agenda. So I will save my comments um, with regards to that. Um, I did want to answer the question by uh, Tom Holland, who is the uh, retired police officer. Um, and he asked specifically and referred to an email that I sent, which I did, sorry, Tim Holland, um, which assures police officers that they would retain their civil service status. And I will refer the listeners as well as Common Council to refer back to the resolution, which was adopted by Council on March 31st of 2021, where we said in a resolve that any implementation of restructuring that would be done as part of the reimagining public safety plan would preserve current officers within the department uh, that they would retain their position and rank, um, that they would not be required to reapply for the positions, and that their uh, civil service status would be protected uh, through this process. In the resolution, that commitment was explicitly made. Now, if through the process, it is determined that some restructuring may impact that, I am presuming that the commitment will continue to be as obligated under the resolution that uh, corrections in the restructuring would be made to ensure that all officers retain their title in civil service status. Um, so I just want to make that clearly and that can be found uh, in the resolution itself. Yeah, I appreciate that. I was actually a little confused by, because I, I didn't remember that from last year and I found your email and actually just forwarded it right before you were about to speak. I forwarded that email to everybody in case others like me on council were confused by the origins of, of those comments. Uh, I just forgotten. Any other uh, responses to the public? George? Am I unmuted? Okay, um, I don't know if Anna can hear me, but Anna, I, I hope you'll call me on the phone to talk about your concerns because I couldn't understand because it was, it was breaking up so badly. I, I couldn't understand what you were saying completely. And I, I do wanna to talk to you. Um, so please give me a holler. Well, um, I- Not now. <laughs> okay, yeah, because so it's, you know, I mean, it's it's not like I don't have nothing against to you, George, but I called you before and it was a lot of concern up there in West Village. And I I I I I, I do not want to not talk. I just need to get some action. That's all. Okay, very good. So give me a call. Um I want to thank everybody who spoke tonight. Uh there was really some valuable uh, points made by the by the people who called in. Um, Heather, I I really value what you said, and you're right. We need more tools in our toolbox, and I think you should be part of this reimagining um, process as one of the um, experts we consult. Um, Alejandro, I really enjoyed what you said. Uh, about community involvement, that's, that's our goal. That's one of our main goals. And Sarah, uh, I also liked very much what you said. And um, you said you were not sure about a commissioner and neither am I. Um, and like you, I believe prevention is 
is one of our goals, prevention of crime and prevention of violence before it happens. Um, and I wanna say to everyone who spoke tonight that um, this first um, suggestion by the task force of which I was a member is a, basically about restructuring IPD. And whether or not this restructuring is approved or whether or not it is modified by council, it's not the end of history imagining, it's just the beginning. And we have many, many, many more things uh, to work out and to improve. That's all I got to say. Thanks, George. Any other comment? I'll just thank everyone who spoke tonight for their input. Um, I took a lot of notes and I plan on incorporating them into our discussion after this, but uh, that's all I'll say for now. Thank you. Yeah, I also appreciate the breadth of comments that we received tonight. And um, uh, we're going to discuss this at length uh, in the days, weeks, months to come. So I um, greatly appreciate it. Patrick? Just one thing to throw out there, because I'm not sure if it was said before, but for everybody who, because I saw a lot of emails about this earlier, anybody who sent written comment, we on council all got it, even if you weren't able to speak. So I appreciate the triple digits that we were reading through uh, of emails earlier today and throughout the day, but it's gotten and received. So if you weren't able to speak, your comment is still going to be included. And if you weren't able to speak because of our technical difficulties, and I didn't have the, the list of speakers following Anna, uh, please do write us and we will read, read everything. Lauren, I suppose you're back. I'm guessing not. So we are supposed to be entering the, uh, the discussion. Hey, Thank you. Thank you, uh, Duxon. Uh, my sincerest apologies. Uh, it's never a good thing when technology doesn't work, but it's especially not a good thing on uh, a night like tonight. Um, let me also express appreciation to everyone who did make comments uh, this evening. Um, and let me uh, start assuming that our internet connection will be stable for the next few minutes. Um, and uh, let me start by saying that uh, we have a discussion of the Reimagining Public Safety Working Group report tonight. It is admittedly an abbreviated time uh, this evening, but uh, I would like to make sure to focus our comments tonight on council's initial comments and identifying any questions. Um, as my council colleagues know, we will be holding a working uh, committee of the whole uh, working group a week from tonight on April 13th at 6 p.m. There will not be, that will not be a time for public comment. However, it will be a further opportunity for Common Council to uh, discuss and to make comment and, and to question uh, parts of the reimagining public safety report. Let, let me just open the comment, our comment time this evening by reiterating um, one of the commenters this evening, uh, Belisa Gonzalez, who worked on the data analysis. She was extremely helpful in phase one of this work. And she too called us, reminded us of the work we're doing really being prompted by the uh, then governor's executive order, executive order 203, which 
Uh, and I am reading now from the printed uh, Public Safety Working Group document. This is available in multiple locations as hard copy. It is also available on the city's website if anyone would like to dig into it in detail. I take it that some, not all, but some of our commenters tonight have had opportunity to do that. But let me just reiterate that all municipalities were called upon to develop a plan to improve public safety policies and practices to better, better serve the community, including addressing any racial bias and disproportionate policing of communities of color. Uh, local legislative bodies were directed to vote on their plan and report to the governor's office by April 1, 2021. We Common Council at the time last year did have robust discussions on the resolution that was ultimately passed. Uh, tonight, I, I would like to remind my colleagues and our audience that the working group uh, that produced this report was co-led by two highly regarded community members well known in our community, Eric Rosario and Karen Yearwood. Uh, the working group composition included members of Common Council, four total, uh, myself, uh, Ducks and Wynn, George McGonigal, and Rob Gerhardt also joined one of the subcommittees. The working group also included uh, Travis from the county uh, legislature. Uh, so it also included police officers. So for anyone who may think the working group was not representative of the police department, I can assure you it was. Uh, that it was not representative of elected officials, I can assure you it was, and was not reflective of community members. That too, I can assure you the working group was. And you can see the full list of members of the working group at the back of the printed uh, report. So tonight, I would like uh, my colleagues and I to uh, stick to factual information, uh, especially factual information on IPD staffing levels. There have been some changes at IPD, as there have been at many organizations, uh, for that matter, including uh, city staff during the past two years. And there are multiple reasons for that. Uh, but it is not the case, in my view, that the reimagining public safety work contributed disproportionately to some of the changes that we've seen. I think we can also all agree on the value, the need for public safety in our community. We share that value, we share that goal and that desire for public safety that best serves the needs of all members of our community and what was heard in a number of the interviews that took place uh, leading to the working group uh, being constituted. There were members of the community who had not uh, felt comfortable stepping forward with their, their comments. So it is important to hear from all members of our community. And I would once again encourage members of the community to send their written comments to Common Council. Uh, tonight, we will be discussing the report. We will similarly be discussing the report at the May Common Council meeting. Tonight is not a voting. Uh, there are no voting items on reimagining public safety tonight. Similarly, at our March 2nd Common Council meeting, there was a full presentation, but there were no votes uh, taken. Um, I will add one final comment myself before turning it over to colleagues. Uh, I can tell you there is ongoing recruitment of new officers and bringing new police officers on board and looking for the most diverse um, members of the, the police department as possible. Um, 
we will have uh, three new police officers coming out of the academy soon and two entering the academy uh, soon. So the sense that the uh, department, uh, that there is a, a, a desire to dismantle or to abolish the police department, I want to firmly disavow that. That is not on the uh, on consideration. Uh, but we do have a great deal to discuss. So let me uh, just stop there. And assuming Wi-Fi continues uh, to be working in City Hall, not something that's always guaranteed, as we've learned tonight. And Duxon, thank you for your assistance. Uh, let me now turn it over to my council colleagues uh, for comments. And again, specifically comments on the, uh, the report. We will, as I've said, have a full working session next Wednesday to dive deeper. But tonight we should be considering comments and identifying questions you'd like to have answers to uh, before next week's meeting. So that being said, I'll turn it over and see who would like to comment. Jorge, I saw your hand first. My hand was definitely not first. <laughs> okay. Just, well, whose hand was first? I think I saw Duxon's. It doesn't matter. Mine'll be quick. Um, yeah, you, you addressed this a little bit, Laura, but a number of comments and emails that we received recently, uh, to be frank, made me feel like I was living in some alternate universe uh, because the, the implication that uh, we're you know dramatically reducing IPD's numbers. I mean, the, the criticism I've been getting is that uh, they have remained largely untouched in this reorganization. Uh, titles remain the same, numbers and staffing retain the same. Um, uniforms, which we talked about, potentially changing are, are, are not. Um, so if there, you know, we have a lot of work to do. There are some very thoughtful uh, comments about uh, call delineation, which I feel is one of the most important parts of this. Uh, and th that's an area where we still have education uh, to do to learn what's legal, what's practical, um, what is just and up to date, um, uh, as uh, Heather Campbell mentioned. But uh, the criticism that IPD is negatively affected by, by this is bizarre and uh, out of touch with, with the reality of the report. And um, that's something I want to emphasize. Thanks. Thank you, Duck. Uh, maybe I'll just go across what, what I see as the squares right now. Uh, so I do see Cynthia, Cynthia's hand up. Cynthia, go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, thank you for, for highlighting that uh, the working group had members of Common Council and members from IPD. Um, I have heard several comments, you know, that uh, that IPD had not been involved. And I just did want to um, speak to that a little bit. Um, throughout this process, I have been informed that members of the working group were prohibited from providing input or, or information to those outside of the working group. Um, unlike other committees, no liaison updates were provided, no updates were given to um, council. So um, there really wasn't an opportunity for those members who were either council members or IPD members to talk with their colleagues, get their impressions, get their feedback, um, and bring those concerns to the working group. So, um, you know, considering we have 10 members of council, uh, I don't think that the four members who were involved are reflective of the interests of council. They definitely don't speak for council. And you can't really say that council was involved in the working group. And likewise, with three members of the police department who were not allowed to speak about the work with their colleagues, I think it is fair to say that IPD was not involved 
in the working group because they didn't have a chance to provide input or feedback. Uh, Cynthia, Cynthia, I'm sorry to, to interrupt, but I must correct your statement just now. Uh, first of all, there were monthly updates at Common Council on the reimagining public safety. There were monthly updates. So I, 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 I disagree because I asked for specifics and I was told that we should wait until the product is done for any questions about specifics. So I, I disagree that you can say we're meeting, we're doing this, we're, we're, being, we're working on the tasks that we've been charged with, but without real information about what the working groups were talking about, there was no way to provide input into the product. Uh, I will tell you, I will tell you that uh, one of the first decisions we made on the working group was um, we discussed and I believe voted, perhaps this was consensus, nevertheless, it was widely held, that we did not want to be signing uh, non-disclosure agreements, but we did, all working group members, agree to respect confidentiality. Uh, there were members of the community, and I will say um, members of IPD who were uh, making suggestions that they wanted to be able to feel free to, to make. Uh, and uh, so for that reason, we were not trying to prevent information. We were trying to allow the working group to do its work uh, in um, without uh, with, with confidentiality at heart. I'm sure people on this Zoom have been members of uh, committees and organizations and groups where you want the free exchange of ideas and you don't want to stifle people's participation so they must feel a sense of uh, confidentiality in, in uh, making their remarks. So I would just caution us to stick to facts. Um, you have said that you have heard certain things and again I would just uh, ask that we stick to uh, factual comments right now on the report. So you have confirmed that there was confidentiality and the working group progress was not discussed. And therefore it is fair to say that council was not involved and nor was IPD involved and only those members involved were involved. So when people say it is untrue that council and IPD were not involved, it is in fact true that they were not. Well, perhaps um, I did have a question. I do have a question that I would like to pass to uh, Eric and Karen as, um, as the co-leads of the working group. So hi, does this hi deal Eric. With the, does this deal with the report? Because that's really what we're intending to speak about. It, it does. It speaks to the makeup and the input that went into the report. And... Um, and I think it is valid uh, to ask these questions. So, hi, Eric. Hi, Karen. So my uh, first question to you is, um, you know, I recognize that as co-chairs and as all members of the working group were appointed by the mayor and as appointment by the mayor to this group in order to provide a service to council um, to recognize, as, as Eric, I know you, you do because you're a former council member, that technically you are um, city officials uh, working on official business of the city and are fall under the review of our uh, city ethics policy. Um, and part of that is to establish standards so that we can demonstrate that uh, there is no appearance of a conflict of interest or uh, undue influence. So my question then for Eric is um, building off of a comment that I heard Karen say that a system is designed 
to get the results that it gets. <clears throat> so Eric, when you became aware of uh, CPE having an intention of dismantling the police department, uh, when that became evident in August, and you were aware that CPE was providing their consultant, Matrix Consulting, to do the data analysis for call delineation. Was there a conscious decision to retain the services of CPE and Matrix? And or was there a decision to say, this is now tainted and we should look back and make sure that the services that we are receiving are unbiased and doesn't have a preconceived outcome? Hi, everyone. Good to see everyone. Hi, Eric. Um, and uh, to Cynthia's question, um, and I appreciate, Cynthia, your, 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 you know, the concern that you're expressing um, and your utmost commitment to the highest ethical standards and that we apply those. So I take your question in that spirit. Um, our charge was outlined by Common Council um, in that March 31st resolution. It was pretty clear. And that's what we were working towards. That charge, um, some of which was mentioned today, alluded to specifically the portion of the resolution regarding um, the um, keeping uh, the you know, police titles um, and their roles intact as defined by the civil service. Um, that was all pretty clearly spelled out. So that's what we were working towards. Um, I didn't see in that resolution anything about dismantling. I didn't see anything in that resolution about anything approximating that. That resolution, the reason I signed up um, was because I believed in what you all voted on unanimously on March 31st and in that resolution and in that model, which is what we worked around. Uh, you asked us to come up with designs around that model. You asked us to come up with naming conventions around that model. And, um, and so uh, my, my, I also welcomed um, at the beginning of this process when the mayor asked me if I would consider leading this. And as most of you might imagine, when I talked to people about whether or not I should do this, 95% uh, of people said I should run for the hills. Um, and, you know, I, um, one of the things I said to the mayor was that I could not do this by myself. And I was really impressed with the work that CPE did in the first phase of this. Really impressed with the approach, with the focus groups, with what I read in that report. I spoke out, I think, um, I don't remember, if it, I think it was that, that March 31st uh, meeting um, in favor of, of, the, of what council was considering because on the strength of that report. So um, I, I asked for the CPE support in this because I could not do that all by myself. And if you're referring to, um, you know, the interview uh, that was given in August um, that I learned about probably as everyone did um, by the uh, co-founder. Um, no, I, I looked at all the work that had been done in that first phase. I looked at um, the resolution that Common Council voted on and that's what um, CPE was supporting us towards realizing all the things that you asked us to do. And um, I saw nothing um, and nothing that would um, have me think anyway, otherwise. Um, and that's what we've done. Um, I think we've met that charge. And so if you talk about dismantling, I don't see that anywhere in the report. It's not reflected. It's meeting the charge that you gave us. And I don't, see, I don't think that there's anything 
tainted about that process and about everyone who was involved. We all were working towards the charge you gave us. You did not see you, any, excuse any me, position. Excuse me, could we, have, could we just have Karen? I, I didn't know if you wanted to add any comment uh, before Cynthia goes on. And I do want to make sure that we hear from all members of council tonight who wish to speak. And we will have opportunity next Wednesday if you want to uh, continue a certain line of thought. But Karen, did you want to add anything oh, to Eric's? Laura, there was one other thing I forgot to add and then Karen, and that's that um, when that interview came out, we did have, um, uh, the working group did meet with um, that co-founder, um, Philip Atiba Goff and he offered, you know, his explanation and an apology. Um, and many members of the working group spoke, you know, who were upset about that, said they accepted his apology. And so we moved on. Um, so it's not as if we ignored it as well. Just wanted to add that as well. Thanks. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Karen, did you want to respond at all? Yes. And we're here as of the executive order 203, where part of it says that the government has responsibility ensuring that all citizens are treated equally, fairly, justly before the law. Here in the city of Ithaca, we have 30,000 regular residents and doubles that with college students. There was representation on the working group from each group and with three police officers and common council members and community members at large. And monthly meetings were given to common council starting from August every month there was either representation from common council member, um, the, how Eric did so, as well as Shelly Michelle Nunn. So um, there was ample representation throughout for this working group. Uh, thank you. And I'm just reminded as Karen is speaking that Duxon also gave a report, I believe early, early on. Uh, I do wanna make sure that we hear in our limited time tonight, from other council members. So Cynthia, happy to come back to your comments once others have had opportunity to speak. We do have a full agenda tonight. So this whole council meeting tonight will not be uh, devoted to this, albeit extremely important issue. And that's why we've called for a committee of the whole one week from tonight. Uh, but Jorge, I, I tried to turn to you first and you- I know, it's right. no, no, no good deed, no worries, but I appreciate it. Um, yeah, no, I, I just wanted to say, I again, I, I've spoken to numerous uh, members of council uh, to the working group uh, folks here, Karen and Eric. Um, thank you again for being here and thank you for all that you've done. Um, I'm very supportive of, of the work that has gone into the working group um, and um, any hesitancy or, or concerns I have has nothing to do with the work that you all have done, but has, if I'm being frank here, has has to do with the with the limitations um, and and that um, that, that were put on you by, in my estimate, council. Um, in terms of the, Divi the Department of Community, uh, the Division of Community Solutions, um, I I love everything that's gone into that. Like I love a great deal that has gone into uh, this um, this report. Um, I'm just concerned that it's nice with a forward front. Uh, front foot, and I know that we've talked about this a lot, that this is going to be the first year, this is the first plank of the report, and this is going to be the first sort of phase of it, and it will develop over time. I want to make sure that we're just not setting it up to fail, um, like like uh, commenters uh, expressed uh, today um, uh, during public comment. Um, I just feel like in my estimate that five responders, uh, unarmed responders, just is is, is not enough. And it, and if we, we talk about the division of police that we've maintained as is, and we have the division of, of community solutions, the disparity there is is, is real. And, I, and I've heard from you all that, you know, even though the division of community solutions is going to be handling a third of this, the five responders at the get-go will not be tasked with doing, uh, with, with, with handling that one third. Well, then we're not setting them up to, 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 to handle what we've tasked them to. And I'm just afraid that with long-term, um, as, as the project goes underway, that at the end of it, um, it won't be able to live up to its fullest potential because we, we hamstrung it and, and it's going to be open to detractors and, and, and then members of, even members of this council might be willing to sort of want to scrap it or move into a different direction, which would defeat the whole process. And so I, I really want the things in this report that are good to be strengthened and great. I, I like what's here. Um, I like what's been done. 
I, I wanted to see it stronger and, 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 and more resolved. And I know, I think Robert, you'll probably touch on this a little bit. I have some concerns about what the long-term funding of, of this division and, and this overall project is going to look like. Um, I, I, I'm just concerned that, you know, we don't, I, we, we're asking a lot of folks here with these, with these new divisions and these new, these new roles um, to essentially build the house. And then we're not asking, we're not giving them the nails to do so. And, and I don't want us, um, you know, uh, to be in the situation where a lot of the work that members of this community have done uh, will be for naught when in a couple of years terms, when they're asked to explain what they've done, um, they didn't have enough nails to build the house. And so we're going to be asking them to either perform another miracle or scrap the project entirely. And so if this is the first foot that we're taking, the first step towards it, um, I want to make sure it's a really strong one. And I think we should be pushing for more than, 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 than currently resides here. And, you know, that's my piece on the matter. Thank you, Jorge. And, and if my colleagues will allow me, um, as both the um, person facilitating this meeting and, and also perhaps more importantly as a working group member, you're reminding me of a couple of comments that I was remiss in not mentioning. And one is that there are members of the community who have responded to the working group report to say, it does not go far enough. Uh, we've heard from other members of the community saying it goes too far. And we've heard from members of the community who have uh, made the point you have about uh, the number, number five unarmed community solutions, community responders is what we initially landed on um, because in some ways this is a new model. It's a uh, uh, an experiment and the, the budget will span multiple budget years. So having said that, let me turn to Robert. I saw your hand up next. Thank you very much. Uh, I will limit my comments to things that colleagues have not already said. Um, first, for the public's benefit, uh, what is the report proposing? It's proposing a civilian commissioner for community safety. I want to be clear, the NYPD has a civilian commissioner. It's proposing a division of community solutions, which is a parallel organization to IPD under said commissioner. As has been stated, it's keeping a full police department. The uniform division is not being altered by any recommendations in this report. Call delineation, which Duxon touched on, uh, and what I understand to be an operational decision that is also, correct me if I'm wrong, Ari and others, is currently undergoing a legal review. Uh, it includes unarmed community solutions workers, which again, widely supported uh, by the community uh, and, and, and city stakeholders. Uh, the training that would be provided has not been deemed controversial and the research and the data collection has not been deemed controversial. I want to reiterate also what the report is not proposing is to abolish our police department. I think as others have said, it was a very unproductive and inflammatory line of political rhetoric to put that out there. And it's tainted the process of how we're now discussing it. I'll conclude with just saying a couple of things about what I think the report needs. And I'll acknowledge, again, Karen and Eric, thank you for your work. It was not the mandate of the working group to project operations out beyond initial recommendations. I wanna acknowledge again, what, uh, what Jorge said about sustainability. I think it's important to, for us to bear in mind tonight, next week, next month, it is incumbent upon council that we do consider these things as we approach drafting a resolution. Another thing I've said several times, and I had the opportunity to speak with uh, uh, and some individuals this week about, independent evaluation. Many of you know, I'm a project director and evaluator by background. For me, I think this is a politically fraught process. And again, it is our responsibility as we decide what to vote on to also identify what metrics for success look like. I share the concern that we don't wanna set a department up for failure. 
So part of the moving forward process needs to be that the 10 of us determine what we think successful implementation of an unarmed division and coordination and cooperation with our uniformed officers looks like. And we need to clearly articulate that to the public. And we need to contract with an outside independent firm through a competitive bid process to look at those data and provide us feedback. I think it also uh, would be worth addressing some of the concerns that we received from District Attorney Van Houten tonight with respect to expanding the type of training that an unarmed force would have. I don't think anybody on this call would want a training deficiency for some of our unarmed workers to compromise a situation that, be, that maybe escalates into a, into, a, into a crime scene or a criminal altercation. So we need to make sure as, as Jorge said, that we're giving everyone the tools that they need to succeed. I also want to just say, you know, investment in the community costs money. And we need to prepare, be prepared to do those things. And whether it's making sure that our public safety is well resourced, or whether it means we're also expanding the services in the community that hit the root causes of crime and things that push people to the margins. Um, again, a lot of other things uh, have been touched on by my colleagues, but in the interest of time, I will, uh, I will yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Uh, George, saw your hand up. You're on mute, George. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm, <clears throat> I'll leave my editorial comments to next time. I, uh, I have some specific questions about um, the budget that's being proposed. Um, and I, I will say that I, I have some concerns about hiring a, a commissioner on top of a uh, chief of police and uh, director of the unarmed unit and underneath, presumably the mayor or a uh, city manager. Um, that's a lot. That's to me. That's top heavy. Um, what I would like to know about the budget is: Will the commissioner have office staff? Um, because that's an additional cost on top of the 1.1 million dollars that we're talking about now. And I would also like to ask: If we change the name of IPD to um, the Department of Community Safety. Does that mean we repaint every police car in the city and change the uniforms? Those are my questions. Thanks, George. Uh, and, and here too, I'll, I'll just add the comment that we, we don't know in response to my response to your question about office staff, we don't know where there could potentially be the potential for shared uh, services, shared administrative services, for example. So that's something still to be considered, to be determined. Does that mean, I don't know what that means. There, well, shared staff, for example, whether it is uh, administrative support, that whether that means payroll, um, we don't have all position descriptions fully flushed out. So that the budget is incomplete. The budget is not finalized. Okay. Uh, Patrick? I know we have another meeting next week, but so I just want to ask questions. I guess the, I'm not sure if it's for Ari or who it's for, but in terms of how um, collective bargaining goes in the sense of how we as the city negotiate with the PBA, how do these five new people fall into that system? Is it, are we treating it like it's two separate bargaining units? Even, even if like say the now community uh, safety one isn't organized, is it two separate units we negotiate with 
or I guess, what does that look like? Yeah, so uh, thank you, Patrick. Um, that's indeterminate in the sense that it's not in the end up to the city. Um, uh, what bar how the bar bargaining units would form. Um, I'm happy to um, discuss that further um, separately as well, but I think it, um, it, does, uh, it, it doesn't have an answer at this time. Good, thank you. Sure. Uh, Rob Gerhard. Yeah, thanks, Laura. Um, and I won't um, necessarily add things that my colleagues have already very carefully uh, shared. And thank you for those comments and questions. But I do want to add one other question, and it sort of picks up a little bit on what Patrick was just asking, and also some of what we heard tonight from commenters. Um, I do feel like we are going to feel some pressures uh, here. On the one hand, I, I hear from some of us and also from others about the pressures of the costs of trying to implement this structure. At the same time, I'm very struck by my Ithaca College colleague, uh, Belisa Gonzalez's comments about the reason we started this initiative in the first place and the very challenging work that she and others did in helping to gather the voices that we need to hear in centering this conversation. So those sometimes might be opposing ideas um, when it comes down to a budget. But I'm also struck by the comments of, I believe it was Sarah Hess who talked very passionately about the need for a changing culture. And so I wanna focus on that and maybe ask some questions and thinking ahead a little bit. So if we were to begin to feel some pressures around the budget, what can we do to help us feel more confident that we could see the kind of culture shift that we really need to happen inside one organization? rather than creating a separate organization and a new umbrella structure over that. And so, so Ari, I, I, don't, I don't know if those are questions that become, you know, what are the impacts of a structure like that? What does it mean to have a chief who may also be a civilian like the commissioner would be? Uh, you know, the, so I think there's a lot of questions for me wrapped up in if we feel that pressure between the budgetary constraints and the ultimate goals of what we had started out to accomplish. How do we reconcile those? So just being prepared for those kinds of issues, I think in our conversations is what I'm asking for, not necessarily for a response right now. I think that's a very uh, good question and one exactly the kind of question that we can uh, be thinking about getting additional information and spending a greater amount of time discussing next Wednesday. So thank you, Rob. No answer tonight, um, but thank you for the question. Uh, George, did you have your hand up again? Yeah, I, I just wanted to respond to what Rob just said because he made some good points. Um, this culture issue is an important issue. I would urge as many of my colleagues as possible to take the time to speak with some of our officers. I would submit that the culture at IPD now is very different than it was in the 1990s. And I'll, I'll just remind us that uh, Shelly has been active in hiring the officers we have now. Um, former Mayor Savante Myrick was as well. We have a good, we have good officers at IPD. And um, when you talk about culture change, um, I actually think that that is, it's more important at the Sergeant level if you will, than bringing in a new commissioner. I, we have a strong group of sergeants and they are emphasizing 
community involvement and helping people. And you don't have to take my word for it. I, I just encourage you to find out for yourself. Thanks, George. Uh, Cynthia? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I definitely, I, I want to thank all the members who participated in these working groups in phase one and phase two. Um, I recognize that the focus has to been to look at policing and how can we um, center policing on the experience of people of color, uh, which is absolutely important. And you look at me and don't realize, of course, that I have a 22 year old black son who lives in this community, works in the community, works downtown, um, is engaged every day. And of course, this means a lot to me and to the people I love because it's very uh, intimate to my family. So it is important to me. Um, it is also important that I, I definitely recognize to address culture change within the department, address culture change anywhere, you need trust, you need buy-in and you need support. And it is so frustrating to me that this process has been so tainted and opportunities to put together a system and bring in consultants and advisors who are, uh, who did not bring with them a, the impression of a conflict of interest was just wasteful to all the good effort that everybody has brought to this process. And it is just disappointing because I think the potential here was great if we could have brought everybody to the table and allowed them to feel heard. And, and that, if I sound frustrated, that's where it comes from. And, and I say this with the deepest respect to Eric and Karen, who are personal friends of mine, although maybe Eric won't speak to me after this, but you know, um, I, I respect them both deeply and for years, personal, personal friends. So this is just frustrating to me. Um, so, okay, all right, I've said it, it's out there. Yeah. Um, I'm going to have some questions. My question is, um, one of the things that I think I find confusing, and I think members of the public find confusing, has to do with the unarmed first responders. I hear people talking about the CAHOOTS model. Um, the CAHOOTS model is a volunteer group of individuals who don't respond to emergency situations. They don't respond to 911 calls. They respond to non-emergency calls, and they bring in uh, volunteers who bring with them uh, a whole variety of skill sets. Um, so when we talk about first responders, um, I just want to be clear and ask a question. My understanding is these first responders are not handling mental health calls, that those calls would actually go to people with expertise in mental health. They're not handling addiction service calls, that those calls under this new system would go to, you know, again, mental health and addiction services, these are county services, these are county responses, not city responses, so that these would still, these unarmed responders are still responding to emergency law enforcement calls, right? That could not be diverted to a mental health call or an addiction recovery call. So I, I do want to clarify if somebody could explain that, um, so that we can understand it, because I will say that um, we are the city, we don't do mental health, that's gonna be someone else. We're not expecting these unarmed first responders to be mental health responders. So that's something I'd like to know. And then the second thing I'd like to know is, are these unarmed responders still law enforcement? Are they still police officers? Or are they not police officers, but we expect them to, do law enforcement things. And then my question then becomes, is that even legal? Going back to the district attorney's comment, like if someone is gathering evidence and for that evidence be used in a court of law, if, ha if it has to, don't they actually have to be a police officer? 
So could somebody explain to me um, what these, just clarify, are these unarmed responders, police officers, law enforcement officers, or are they not? Can you clarify and confirm these are not mental health respondents, these are not addiction recovery respondents, these are not social services respondents, these are, these are respondents that are responding for emergency calls, um, going to 911, um, and technically a legal response. Could you clarify that, please? Well, I'll, I'll just jump in and say that the um, community re responders are not police officers. Uh, those uh, officers, and I think it has been clarified earlier, uh, armed officers will still be uh, police officers. What we didn't touch upon is co-response. There will be calls where both armed and unarmed response will be there. And uh, then uh, after assessing a call, a situation, it can be deemed a safe situation that could be handled by an unarmed officer. But um, I'll, I'll let others uh, jump in with any, any responses to that. And I, I've got another response to one of the things you raised, but I don't know if anyone else wants to comment on that. Well, yes. Um, thank you, Laura. Mayor Lewis, sorry. That's okay. um, and um, under the um, unarmed responders with the Division of Community Solutions, we stated one of the call types was um, um, property check. So the unarmed responders would respond to quality of life calls that go through 911. So property check and, and um, other calls like that. And someone had stated before about um, we're building a house. We're not building a house from scratch. We're expanding a house <laughs> is what we're doing. And in that expansion, we looked at the CAHOOTS model. We looked at other models, but we heard the needs of this community, of the Black Brown community, the unhoused community members, the um, individuals that have been disproportionately served by police. So we listened and heard from them from the first phase back in 2020, as well as throughout this whole process when our working group have been active. And we're, what, what's different, I won't go into the different op-eds that's been coming through, is that we're talking about marginalized communities that are the onset of policing has been negatively served from, from um, throughout this whole nation. We're talking about looking at it differently so that they don't get caught up in the police system. So therefore we go back to executive order 203 and who we're serving, black, brown communities, um, communities um, that have um, been marginalized by the police. Go ahead, Panthea. <laughs> so uh, I'm sorry, Eric, did you, did you want to respond to that point, Eric? Uh, yeah, I, I'll add a, a little bit more to what Karen said, if that's okay, Cynthia. Um, and you know, we'll we'll still be friends. You know, this this is this is a community, right? That is really engaged, and we debate and we go through this. And I would hope we would all still be friends, even if we hold very you know um, wide ranging views on things, or wide ranging views on processes, or whatever it might be. Um, you know, I I think um, that's 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 the beauty of our community. So I would hope that you know, we're all still gonna to get together and still talk and um, enjoy our new Department of Community Safety. Sorry, I have Thank to- Thank you. I, I, I hope we can <laughs> share your flan and I'll have my Kahlua pig and we'll, Absolutely. You know, we'll have our meal together. There we go. Um, <laughs> so uh, just, just one thing, one point, you mentioned Cahoots. So Cahoots actually, and you're right, they are a, um, they're not part of the municipal, they're not part of Eugene, Oregon. As part of the municipal government, they're handled by the White Bird Clinic. But um, just just a point of I think you may have said they don't get nine one one calls and you may have meant that in another sense but I just want to just want to uh, confirm actually that nine one one calls are rerouted to cahoots they get nine one one calls the nine one call one calls that they get are um, related to addiction disorientation mental health crises and homelessness 
So they are a part of the of um, the dispatch menu of options along with police and EMS. So they are a part of that. Um, so they do get 911 calls. Um, and as you pointed out, um, the um, those areas, mental health, um, are a county responsibility. And we, we, we write about that here, that we recognize that, um, that, that <clears throat> and um, we also know that we're just one plank in this whole reimagining process. And there's another one, um, which is evaluating existing models and implementing an alternative to law enforcement response system for crises intervention and wraparound health and human service delivery. So what we're recognizing is, you know, maybe there could be a role for the city um, in partnership with the county in that area. Um, and basically, this is a blueprint, and we say we 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 say explicitly these there are certain types of calls that need to be further. We need to have further refinement of them with the help of the commissioner and the director and working with all the stakeholders. So. Um, you know, a commenter said this is kind of a baseline. I would say this is the beginning of with certain calls to um, and, and working through the other planks for a great opportunity to really build on this um, blueprint that we're giving. Um, this is not the end all be all, and which is relates to also the DA's op ed. Like he mentioned one specific example um, um, sexual offense, you know, and the collecting of evidence. Uh, we actually put that in the category of it depends. We didn't say, and it depends, we, we, we say clearly, there are a couple of ways that this might be handled and it depends. Um, could be, co-response could be that an unarmed growth comes first, or maybe the armed comes first, or maybe they arrive simultaneously, or maybe there's what's known as staging where the um, um, armed goes in first and then unarmed follows up. Um, we've never said that with, with any of those calls, an unarmed responder will um, come first to collect evidence. We had law enforcement, um, a very robust law enforcement presence in the, on, the, on the task force. And we talked about on the working group and we talked about that explicitly actually, that, that one category that you're gonna need um, currently in our current model will be a police officer. Um, but that's not to say that over time, as we continue to refine this model, um, you do have some places where an unarmed responder would collect evidence who are members of a lab um, uh, that isn't, um, that in some jurisdictions you can have that. Will, would, with this, with the architecture that we're providing, you know, allow, give us the flexibility to um, over time, think about maybe having that? Why not? But um, it, it does. And that's what, that's the beauty of what we're proposing. Uh, so, um, there are current calls that are county, um, that the county really has um, ownership of, and we acknowledge that, but that doesn't preclude in the future um, uh, some partnership and plank two of uh, reimagining gets into that, that could, um, uh, you know, that, that could give us uh, something we are not even imagining today. So um, uh, that's all I wanted to add on that piece, that this is not meant to say, this is the end all be all that we've written here, but there's a lot of uh, room for refinement and uh, that kind of flexibility to refine this further. And one of the reasons why we were starting with five as well um, as, we, as we get into this, but I'll stop there. I just wanted to add a little bit to what Karen said. Thanks, Eric and, and Karen. Um, George, is your hand up? And, and uh, yeah, I know that we could talk about this topic all evening, which is why we'll have right. a meeting next Wednesday. So right. I see George and I see Jeffrey, and then we will move on through our agenda tonight. Fair enough. Um, I want to speak to uh, Jorge's concerns, and I also want to make a comment on what uh, Karen said. Jorge, uh, I think the five number is, is very small, and but we don't really know how, how they're going to work yet and where they'll be most effective. This is, this is new. And um, the, two, the two units, the police and the community resolutions officers, 
are going to have to work together to figure out how these calls um, can best be handled. The, and the police now, when, when there's a new officer, they, they spend almost a year with another officer um, learning the ropes. So I think the, the unarmed people will be primarily working with, with police officers, at least initially. Um, and I think the police are looking forward to having help from an unarmed force um, and cooperating together. Um, to Karen's point about um, police um, interactions with people of uh, minority, minority people and people who um, have been uh, I'm losing my words. Um, in Ithaca, New York, the police don't get called to uh, Bell Sherman very often or Fall Creek very often. They get called to um, neighborhoods that are challenged much more frequently. Um, on West Hill, the residents of West Village and Chestnut Apartments um, often ask me, where are the police? We need more police. We need better protection for our families. So I think we need to keep that in mind too. Everybody, and I'll say this, everybody wants to be treated with respect. That is key to what we're doing. Um, and and it, that's key, but uh, we, we need to protect our uh, underserved population as well. Thank you. Thanks, George. Uh, Jeffrey, last comment, question before we move on? Uh, sure, yeah. So I, I kind of want to speak to two different things. One is what I did not hear in Eric and uh, Karen's answer to Cynthia's inquiry, um, which I think at the heart of that was just, what is the actual legal definition of these two different roles? And uh, between the unarmed and the armed officers, what are the parameters of their function? And I think what's important in understanding that clearly is uh, we need to know the liabilities of having these two different kinds of officers working in conjunction with each other, working separately from each other. That's been a concern of mine from the beginning of this whole process, uh, understanding the legal liability that the city has. When an officer who was instructed to work this way, it just doesn't go the way they expected. And really we should have had a different officer, a different kind of officer address the issue. Um, so that's something to consider. Uh, you know, I think it sounds like we've got work to do to, to hammer that out and understand what the, those officers bring to the table and what the expectation of their, their, uh, of their function is, I guess, um, in, in, in policing daily, day to day. Um, and the other thing is to, and it, maybe it's nice to bring a little closure to this uh, initial conversation here is to refer back to Duck's point um, to suggest that nothing uh, significant is really changing here for the IPD. Um, that really runs contrary and even diminishes, I think, our perception of the public's perception of, of how serious this work is and how serious, significant and substantial it is that we are discussing this. Um, to bring an issue that has the potential of requiring a referendum to the, the forefront of our conversation and to spend over a year talking about it that is significant and substantial. And it has had repercussions. Uh, I think I heard very clearly and, and wrote about it this week. It has had repercussions on, on folks who uh, decided they could not stay at the, 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 the police department under these circumstances. Um, the turmoil that we have created through this conversation and that in the ranks of the IPD, that is real and undeniable. It is significant and substantial. Um, so I, I think uh, we should be careful there. Thank you, Jeffrey. Yeah, and I, I think 
you know, I, I would agree with you that we should be careful in drawing conclusions. You know, as I said earlier, we there are staff members who have retired in multiple departments in the city and in other organizations as well. Uh, recruiting is a challenge in all organizations. Um, so uh, I would uh, first let me apologize for being flustered at the outset of this discussion. The, the challenge of the city's Wi-Fi going on and off flummoxed me and uh, did not um, maybe have me begin this discussion in as calm a manner as I might have pre uh, preferred. Uh, but I do appreciate everyone's uh, comments and questions. Uh, I also appreciate Duxon coming and saving the day earlier when uh, I couldn't get back on quickly enough. Uh, but it seems that we have plenty of areas to discuss uh, next week at the Committee of the Whole on the 13th, budget questions, uh, unarmed responders, role, training, and some uh, questions about the um, what is permitted of those, uh, those officers. And a few of you have commented, and, and we heard this earlier too, of the importance of the two units working closely together. Um, forgive me, but the image I keep thinking of is that if our DPW streets and facilities does not work closely with water and sewer, our city is not well served. Taxpayers are not well served. And we want to do everything possible to ensure public safety for all members of the community. We wanna be cognizant of um, costs. And I think as someone else has sort of alluded, um, you know, our budgets follow our values. And there are times when uh, we will make those difficult decisions um, because our budgets will follow our values. One, one great example in the past couple of years in our budget discussions is the uh, budgetary commitment the city has made to the Green New Deal, for example. So there's more to discuss. We will have opportunity for further discussion. Uh, next Wednesday, and I do appreciate everyone's comments and questions and hopefully Wi-Fi, hopefully city Wi-Fi will uh, work for, for the remainder of, uh, of our meeting. So I would also like to thank Eric and Karen for joining us tonight, responding to questions. Um, the last thing I will mention is there have been a number of town halls uh, this is in response to one of Cynthia's questions or comments about um, uh, who has, has been informed. And there were, you know, in phase one, there were interviews. Now with this report, there are multiple town halls. I think at the, um, there was a black town hall, there was a, a Latino Civic Association town hall, there was a wide open town hall that had 50 some uh, people in attendance. So there's a lot of discussion around this discussion. We live in a small community and I know that I bump into people on the street who want to talk about this. So I think it's very good that we are having these discussions and these discussions will continue as, me, as we uh, move forward. There uh, also has been input from community leaders of color uh, there was a meeting just the other morning and they were able to uh, make comments and, and voice support uh, for, for this plan. So at this point, let's all take a, a deep sigh and um, move through our, our uh, agenda tonight, okay? Thanks everyone. Uh, next on our agenda is uh, the consent agenda. It was Cynthia requested that uh, 3.2 approval of recreational partnership agreement be removed from consent as well as uh, removal of the uh, release of Southside Community Center funding in 2022 budget. So uh, when 
we move past the consent agenda and I'll turn the floor over to my colleague and chair of city administration, Robert Cantomo. He will tell us where he wants to add those items, but is, uh, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda as amended? Robert and uh, second Rob. So the two Robs, thank you. All those in favor of approving the consent agenda. That looks unanimous. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and Robert, I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you very much. Um, all right, and uh, so I'll start with uh, existing 4.1 uh, DPW request to increase the authorization of capital project 869, College Avenue reconstruction and award contract for construction. And just, this is again a project where the, essentially it's designing and building an underground telecom system, uh, accommodating city and NYSEG underground uh, infrastructure, and then reconstructing uh, the street and sidewalks at Mitchell Street, Dryden Road. Uh, Resolved that the Common Council hereby approves the above subject project and be it further resolved that the sum of uh, 1,850,000 is hereby appropriated from the issuance of serial bonds and made available to cover the costs of the project and be it further resolved the Common Council hereby amends Capital Project 869 uh, College Avenue Reconstruction to include the additional project cost of $1.85 million bringing the total authorization to 2.85 million and be it further resolved, the Common Council directs the engineering division to submit all eligible costs in excess of the original 1 million authorized for this project to the New York State Department of Transportation for reimbursement. And be it further resolved, the superintendent of public works is hereby authorized to award the construction contract to set Seneca Stone Corporation 2747 Canoga Road, Seneca Falls, New York for their low bid of 2.26 uh, million and proceed with the project and I'll move uh, the resolution as written. Do you wanna ask for a second? Oh, sure. Uh, is there a second, I see Patrick. Uh, again, this is, I mean, as you'll see in the attached packet, right? There's a, this is an existing project uh, fairly straightforward, um, but uh, we do have, I think I saw Tim, yeah, here he is. Tim is here if, uh, if you have any questions. I see Cynthia. Hi, Tim, thank you. Um, so I, I recognize that uh, costs have gone up uh, significantly um, and are, is any of this reimbursable? I, I see in the memo that it it might be eligible for reimbursement under the state touring route program. So currently without, currently how much of this is reimbursable and how much do we hope will be reimbursed if that grant is successful? Uh, it's not a grant. Those funds are actually uh, an allocation to the city. This touring route money is very much like our annual chips allotment. There's okay. a minor difference in what's eligible, but it, it can basically pay for any road construction related costs. So that $1.85 million is fully reimbursable through the touring route program. Good to know, thank you. I don't see any further discussion. I think procedurally you need to call for the vote, Laura. Okay, we're ready to vote. All those in favor? That looks like it's unanimous too. Thank you. Uh, moving to 4.2, uh, DPW amendment to capital project 733 for the Cass Park rink enclosure. Um, this is again, just a matter of uh, uh, cost amendment to an existing project. Um, 
Again, I'll read the results. Resolve the Common Council hereby amends capital project 733 by $400,000 for the project, bringing the total authorization to 3,752,700 and be it further resolved that funds needed for said amendment shall be derived from issuance of serial bonds and be it further resolved. Common Council hereby authorizes the superintendent of public works to award and execute contracts with the lowest, with, with the low bidders for the cast park rink enclosure project. That was a mouthful. I will move as written. And I'm seeing in the chat that Mike is here. Oh yeah, sorry, Duxon, I see your uh, second. So any discussion? So I'm, I'm sorry, I'm seeing in the chat here. So Mike is here. Oh, but for 4.4, yes. So uh, Uh, and it was Tim who um, attached the supporting memo here, right? Mm -hmm. So, Tim, did you have anything additional? I don't think so. I'm happy to answer questions if there are any. George? Yeah, this is the home stretch on this project. And it came in a little, well, not a little, it came in over what we budgeted because uh, construction costs have gone up. Um, the electrical aspect, uh, the dehumidifying we wanted to have as part of the Green New Deal type of thing. And uh, this is a great project. It's, the rink is gonna be so much improved. And this time next year, um, this will be done. So I fully support this. Thanks, George. Yeah, we have been talking about this for years, right? It's nice to see in the home stretch. Are we ready to vote? Okay, all in favor of this resolution, 4.2. And that too looks unanimous. Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, 4.3 is support of state legislation to allow the reduction of the citywide default speed limit from 30 miles per hour to 20 miles per hour. Uh, therefore, be it resolved by the Common Council of the City of Ithaca, New York, that Section 1, the City of Ithaca hereby expresses its support for Assembly Bill uh, 1007 and Senate Bill 2021 and requests that its state representatives, Assembly Member Anna Kellis and Senator Tom O'Mara, support this legislation and ask the prime sponsors to amend the bill to allow reductions to 20 miles per hour and that our representatives do all in their power to advance this bill with the 20 mile per hour amendment in the New York State Legislature. And I will move as written. I didn't see whose hand went up first. Who, who was second? I don't know either, either me or George. All right. Let's say George. <laughs> and I'll, I'll slow down in his truck. I'll just note again, this is a, another long standing sort of discussion in the community. Um, I think two things I'd like to flag for, for colleagues and for the public. Um, we are expressing support of this bill in Albany while also requesting that the bill lower that threshold from 25 to 20. The legislation cited in this resolution currently states 25. And uh, the intention here would be uh, that the city would be happy to adopt 25, I think through large parts, but would like that flexibility for where needed for safety reasons to lower uh, 220. And I'd also just remind folks that uh, this, at, at present, this is, this is a non-binding right, support resolution. I had some uh, concern from the community about uh, us changing this uh, without the state. We are in fact, expressing support of that state uh, legislation. Thanks, Rob. Uh, all in favor? Okay, great. That too looks unanimous. And this is another one of those topics that we have been discuss discussing uh, and that Eric Hathaway has been extremely helpful on over a number of years. In the packet, you'll see Eric Hathaway's 
uh, letter, the Vision Zero Initiative from January 2019. So this, this is really great to, to pass this resolution tonight. Thank you. I will now move 4.4 and hope colleagues will indulge me. Uh, this has been a, uh, a topic of somewhat uh, important conversation. So I will read the entire resolution for, for, for public benefit here. Uh, this is DPW authorization of hazard mitigation grant program application. Whereas the New York State Division of Homeland Security and Emergency Services has announced the availability of Federal Emergency Management Agency Hazard Mitigation Grant Program funds for the following presidential declaration. And whereas prioritization criteria for the award of the grant includes projects that address climate change, adaptation and resiliency, projects that reduce risks associated with flooding, projects that protect and or mitigate risk to critical infrastructure and utilities, and projects that are identified in a FEMA approved hazard mitigation plan. And whereas the city of Ithaca has completed a local flood hazard analysis in 2020, which identified flood risks from a 100 year event along with specific mitigation measures to reduce those flood risks. And whereas the city of Ithaca has recently adopted the FEMA approved hazard mitigation plan update prepared by Tompkins County, which includes the mitigation measures identified in the LFHA and whereas FEMA recently issued draft flood maps for the city of Ithaca, which are consistent with the flood risks identified in the aforementioned study, and will eventually replace the 1981 flood insurance rate maps and show a significantly larger flood zone than the 1981 maps, which will greatly affect the number of properties requiring flood insurance. And whereas the proposed mitigation measures will increase flow capacity for Fall, Cascadilla, and Six Mile Creeks, prevent backflow related flooding through the storm system, reduce flood risk for large portions of the city, and reduce the flood zones shown on the proposed FEMA maps. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the mayor of the city of Ithaca is hereby authorized and directed to submit an application in accordance with the provisions of the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program for Presidential Declaration DR4480 in an amount not to exceed $12 million, and upon approval of said request, to enter into and execute a project agreement for such financial assistance to the city of Ithaca for design, right-of-way acquisition, construction, and construction inspection of a project as described above. And be it further resolved that contingent upon award of the HMGP funds, the Common Council hereby authorizes the establishment of Capital Project 913 to pay in the first instance 100% of the federal and non-federal share of the cost of all work for the project and be it further resolved that contingent upon award of the funds, the sum not to exceed $3 million is hereby appropriated from serial bonds and made available to cover the cost of participation in the above projects in the first instance. And be it further resolved that the total project costs shall not exceed $12 million with the understanding that the breakdowns of funds to be approximately 9 million in HMGP funds and 3 million in the city serial bond financing to be administered by the superintendent of public works and be it further resolved that the event uh, that in the event the full federal and non-federal share costs of the project exceed the uh, amount appropriated above the city of Ithaca common council shall convene as soon as possible to appropriate said excess amount immediately upon the notification by the N Y S D H S E S thereof and be it further resolved that the mayor of the city of Ithaca be and is hereby authorized to execute all necessary agreements and the superintendent of public works is hereby authorized to execute all certifications or reimbursement requests uh, for funding on behalf of the city of Ithaca in connection with the advancement or approval of the project and providing for the administration of the project and the municipality's first instance funding of project cost and permanent funding of the local share of federal aid and all project costs that are not so eligible be it further resolved that this resolution shall take effect immediately. I move as written. Is there a second? Duck? I see that Mike is here. Uh, any discussion? George? Muted. George, you're still muted. Well, at least I was muted when I cussed. Um, 
Thanks, Laura. Mike, I was at the county ledge last night and uh, they wanted more specific information about what types of uh, uh, projects this would include on the creeks. Sure. So um, when we did the uh, local flood hazard analysis, uh, we had the USGS prepare flood models for us. And then uh, Bartman Lajudis came up with various mitigation options. And those options still need to be developed a little bit. And that will be part of this uh, grant. Uh, when FEMA came out with their maps, their maps were very close. And they used the same technique that the USGS used. And so we believe that the mitigation measures that uh, Barton and LaJudas proposed will still hold true with the FEMA maps. When we do the grant or when we get into uh, design work and final analysis, FEMA said that we, um, that they will share their flood model with us um, so that we can base our design uh, on, on their actual flood model that they're using. <clears throat> which is very similar to the one that we did. But what this, uh, what Barton and Lajudas came up with was um, that we need to increase capacity along Six Mile Creek and, uh, well, actually Six Mile, Cascadilla, and Fall Creeks. And uh, to do that, um, we'll have to essentially raise the, um, uh, We could use flood walls, we could build up berms, but essentially we need to raise up the, uh, the edges of the creek so that they hold more water when more water starts flowing down those. Um, in some cases, we may be able to build up berms. Uh, in some cases, like on Cascadilla Creek, we're very short on uh, space. So we may do some type of uh, flood wall. Um, we do plan to work with uh, a landscape architect so that we don't put ugly walls up next to our beautiful creeks so we could do something that has some sort of uh, aesthetic design with it as well, but also be functional. Um, on Fall Creek, the, uh, the levees that are there next to the high school and in the Fall Creek area, they're probably the right height, but they are showing signs of erosion. And so we do want to um, include um, armoring those levees and make sure that they can handle larger flows in the future. And so we, we are wrapping that into this project as well. Uh, the the uh, backflow preventers we're also going to put on the outlets into the creek because what we notice is when we get uh, high flows or when we get ice jams, the water in the creek rises to a level where it's hot, where it's higher than the surrounding catch basins. And so you get backflow into the neighborhoods and you get flooding that way. Um, so that's the, that's the bulk of what we're looking to do. Mike, is, is dredging part of this? Um, so there's two pieces to get the city of Ithaca um, to, to eliminate most of the flood risk. Um, the grant that uh, we're, we're shooting for right now with the flood walls and the backflow preventers, that will take care of most of the city. It will alleviate most of the flooding in the city, but not all of it. And so the second piece is the dredging project that the, the DEC is still working on. And um, Right now, the DEC is, they're projecting 2023 dredging. Um, I'll believe it when I see it, but uh, I think that uh, the project uh, that we're proposing and the DEC dredging project will probably happen at approximately the same time. And so what we're hoping is that with both projects in place, we can uh, quickly get FEMA to revise their flood maps. Thank you. Sure. Mike, if I could ask a question. The, sure. uh, what I'm hearing from a number of residents has to do with the anticipated significant increase in flood insurance 
if these maps, um, proposed maps are finalized and include a far greater uh, area, all of, of the flats, for example, um, can you say something about the impact these mitigation efforts may have on flood insurance? Well, it's a, it's a good question. And so we've been talking with FEMA about their timeline. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, FEMA plans on uh, um, turning those draft flood maps into the regulatory maps in uh, January of 2024. Um, we hope to be in final design for these flood mitigation measures and uh, hopefully we'll also have dredge underway in 2024. We've been asking FEMA if they'll hold off on issuing the flood maps so that they don't become effective um, until after we uh, do our mitigation measures and we would immediately turn in what's called a letter of map revision which would reduce the uh, flood maps um, in a sense essentially show that the flood risk has been mitigated in Ithaca and this is this is flood risk from the creeks we have some nuisance flooding throughout the city this does not address that but this just uh, this just addresses the major flooding from the creeks that flow through so FEMA is chewing on that idea a little bit. I think if we were able to win a grant, we might have a stronger case to um, push FEMA to hold off on those on issuing those maps. That's what we're hoping, but uh, no promises. So in the meantime, what we're trying to do is just uh, do the right thing, uh, mitigate the flood risk in the city, and then the rest is, is going to be a lot of uh, back and forth with FEMA, I'm sure. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Duxon, did you have a question? Excuse me. Um, yeah, Mike, so uh, like Laura, I've been getting all kinds of questions on mailing lists and whatnot. And uh, one thing that people seem to really want dredging, uh, but when I remember from the, the 2019 public meeting on the, the flood hazard study, um, someone brought up, it may have been you or maybe the consultant that, in terms of cost effectiveness, it was actually these other measures like raising berm heights, um, and sediment traps, et cetera, that you know are more cost effective. And um, do you have thoughts on that? Uh, do you still, nonetheless, see a role for dredging Six Mile and Cascadilla in particular? So people will bring up like in along Cascadilla, there's a lot of plant growth and, uh, it's, and detritus on the bottom. And to them, when they see that it's higher than the water level most of the time, uh, they feel like it should be dredged. So I don't know if you have thoughts on that. Yeah, I do. Um, so we, when we were doing the flood hazard analysis and we were looking at increasing the capacity in the creeks, we did, uh, we did discuss this with the USGS and also with uh, Barton and Lajudas. We also had um, one of the, uh, hydraulics professors from Cornell University in on that, uh, he was in our group. Um, we could dredge Six Mile Creek, because um, I know the areas that you're talking about, Duxon. Um, the problem is, is that the creeks will tend to stabilize. They want to be at a certain elevation. And so we'll constantly be dredging those. Um, what happens is the creeks will, will generally sort of get to that level that they naturally want to be at. And so if we dredge, they'll fill back up again. It, but they won't, they shouldn't fill up more than they are right now. In fact, what the USGS said that we should do in the creek there is just uh, make sure that we keep the brush down because that, that in effect uh, is more effective than doing the dredging work. And uh, certainly a lot uh, simpler to do that. So by raising the creek walls, we don't change the bottom of the channel. So the, the channel bottom should remain fairly stable, but the, the channel just isn't deep enough for, for a hundred year flood. Thank you. Cynthia? Thank you. 
Um, so I, I'm looking back at the report that uh, is dated to December 2018. <laughs> it's hard to believe we've been talking about this for four years. Um, and um, I know at that time it was recommended to do these berms and then backflow preventers um, that was estimated the berms would be between two and six feet in height, um, depending on the area, obviously. Um, and so I visually am imagining Fall Creek. I'm imagining Cascadilla raising the berms in Cascadilla Creek. I'm imagining Six Mile Creek raising the berms. If I imagine six feet, it basically means you won't see across the creek, uh, into the creek or, or um, into the neighborhoods behind. Um, should I also be imagining berms along uh, the flood control channel? Because obviously, um, we're considering not only water that's coming through the creeks, but water that's coming back from the lake. Um, are you including that in this plan or are you only thinking about flooding that's gonna be coming from overtopping of the creek walls? So, um First of all, let me, um, I, I forgot to answer one question that Bepson had on uh, the dredging, uh, the cost benefit analysis. I just wanna uh, address that really quickly. The, uh, the improvements that we're looking for on this grant have a, have a high benefit cost ratio. FEMA generally looks for something that's greater than one. Barton and Lajutis is working on a revised one. We think it's gonna be uh, over two. Which puts us in a good, which puts us in good shape to win a grant. The dredging in the flood control channel, which is a DEC project, has a benefit cost ratio less than one, just for perspective. But the, the state is funding that and they're they're in charge of that. So I, I sorry I didn't answer that. Cynthia, the, the final local flood hazard analysis report uh, was. Uh, the final date on it was February 2020, and it's on the website, and it goes through um, uh, it goes through all the recommendations and what the flood risk is. What I would suggest is that in the appendix, we also had um, the PowerPoint presentation that we gave to the public, and there's a lot of good graphics in that. And one of the graphics is it shows along the creeks approximately how high and in what locations we would have to raise the uh, berm height or the creek walls. And so off the top of my head, the um, <clears throat> Fall Creek uh, probably could get by without raising anything. We certainly want to um, make those levees more robust, take care of those erosion issues, but on Fall Creek, probably not a big change there. Um, we do get quite a bit of backflow on Fall Creek, so we'll do the work uh, with the backflow, excuse me, backflow preventers on Fall Creek. Cascadilla Creek, I think, showed uh, an increase of uh, anywhere from one to two feet. We could probably do an earthen berm there or a low wall. Um, again, we're we want to work with a uh, landscape architect so that uh, we put something there that's aesthetically uh, pleasing to the neighborhood. Six Mile Creek, the areas that are of highest concern are uh, just west or just downstream of the Cayuga Street Bridge. And I think some of the wall heights in those locations are in the four they might even get up to six feet in some locations. Those are the areas that we would uh, probably have a wall, but we would certainly want to still maintain access to the creek. Um, uh, a lot of the high walls on Six Mile Creek would be down uh, kind of um, behind Cayuga Lumber, places that are you know, the public doesn't really see that much. Um, 
so anyway, uh, yeah, we certainly have some design work to do, and and uh, you know we'll we'll uh, get input from the community and from uh, planning department, and um, you know we don't want to put something ugly there. Same time, um, we also want to prevent flooding in those neighborhoods as well. So, and Mike, I, maybe Mike, maybe you mentioned this, um, but I, I sorry if I overlooked. Um, but given the interest of the public and the concerns of the public, particularly around, and, and developers, I have to say too, um, about cost, uh, it would be good at some, think about at what point it would make sense to hold another public meeting um, and have the Barton and Lajutis, uh group come back. Maybe once you know uh, decisions on some of these grant programs would be a good time to do that. Yeah, and I think once we start getting into design, we certainly want to have public input, and and um, again, we want we want something that looks good as well as as uh, provide provide the functions that we need it to. Cynthia, you asked about the flood control channel. The flood control channel um, is fine how it is. It does need to be dredged. Um, both the USGS and FEMA modeled uh, the flood maps based on the 100 year high lake elevation, which uh, we think is a little bit overly conservative. However, we also had the USGS take a look and FEMA is going through this exercise right now. Does it matter if the lake level is high or lake level is low? It certainly affects things around the parks and hangar theater and the golf course and things like that. But uh, once you get uh, the elevation um, rises a little bit as you get into the neighborhoods, uh, the lake level doesn't have that much effect. Okay, thanks for uh, the very helpful discussion around this. Are we ready to vote now on this resolution? Okay. All in favor? Great, thank you. That looks unanimous. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Turning now 4.5, Hangar Theater Company request for study and insurance. Uh, be it resolved that the city of Ithaca fully fund an engineering study to assess flood mitigation opportunities for an amount not to exceed $30,000 with the funds being derived from capital project 875, assessment of Cass Park fields and buildings. And be it further resolved that the Hangar Theater Company will assist in raising funds for flood mitigation efforts uh, revelated by their engineering study and will make decisions in partnership with the city of Ithaca. And be it further resolved that the city of Ithaca shall add the cost of flood insurance currently estimated at $5,800 annually to the hangar theater building under until the completion of the study to determine what can be done to prevent the further flooding of the property and the building. And be it further resolved, the hangar theater company respectfully requests the following of the city of Ithaca. One, fully fund an engineering study to assess flood mitigation opportunities. Two, carry flood insurance on the hangar building, including premium and deductible. Three, support hangar theater in finding a new location should the results of the engineering study indicate that continuing to use the building as a theater over the long term prove unfeasible, infeasible. The hangar theater will, one, work with the city to raise funds for feasible flood mitigation efforts revealed by the engineering study and make decisions in partnership with the city. Two, continue to make investments in the building to minimize damage from floods and take the lead on cleanup and reporting to insurance when the theater floods. Three, continue to support efforts by the Ithaca Landmark Preservation Commission to get on the historic register. Four, supply the city with records and information about the historic hangar building and its significance in our community. And I move the resolution as written. Is there a second? Was that Cynthia's hand? Okay, thank you. Uh, discussion. Laura or Julie, um, RJ is in the holdings place, I think. She's here to answer any questions that we have. Thank you. Are there any questions?
Cynthia? Uh, I don't have any questions, but I'm glad to see this come to council. Um, I, I think this is a, a, a worthy uh, investment to investigate uh, flood considerations at the hangar, um, the support that we can provide to the hangar with flood insurance uh, during this time uh, will help us to uh, continue in the years forward. And I just really want to uh, thank the city for their support for the hangar uh, over the years and into the future. Thank you. Uh, so are we ready to vote? <clears throat> All right. All those in favor of 4.5 resolution? Okay, thank you. That looks unanimous as well. Uh, if somehow my eyes are failing and I miss anyone's vote and there's not a unanimous vote, please just let me know. Thank you. Rob, back to you. Thanks, Laura. I will now, uh, I guess it'll be 4.6 will now be, uh, I'm gonna insert here the approval of recreation partnership agreement. Uh, remember, this is the item we all remove from consent agenda. Um, whereas the undersigned municipalities enter into this intermunicipal shared services agreement for a five-year renewable recreation partnership, and whereas the membership of the recreation partnership includes towns of Caroline, Danby, Dryden, Enfield, Groton, Ithaca, Newfield, and Ulysses, including Trumanburg School District, the village of Lansing, city of Ithaca, and Tompkins County, and whereas this agreement shall be effective upon execution by each and every part, uh, participating municipality and shall be enforced for the period beginning January 1, 23 through December 31, 27, and may be renewed for an additional five years by appropriate resolutions by each of the municipal partners on or before December 31, 2027. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the City of Ithaca will continue its membership in the Recreation Partnership Agreement from January 21, I'm sorry, January 1st, 23, to December 31st, 27. And be it further resolved that the city of Ithaca will continue to contribute one quarter of the total cost of the recreation partnership, an amount that is determined and recommended by the recreational partnership board annually to participating municipalities. And be it further resolved the common council votes to approve this recreation partnership agreement for 2023 to 2027 and authorize his acting mayor Lewis to enter into the contract I so move. And Rob G seconds. Discussion, Cynthia. Thank you. Um, I see that this was not really discussed at CA. It was in consent in CA. So I just wanted to bring this out. Um, I definitely in my time as uh, chair of the GIAC board and many years in involvement in the GIAC board, um, have come to recognize that an increasing number of the participants in our activities at GIAC, including recreational after-school activities, are of uh, non-city residents. Um, and I think when the recreational partnership was first initiated, it had mainly looked at the Youth Bureau um, because most of the participants at GIAC were city residents. And I would very much like to encourage those who are renegotiating these agreements as they are reviewed every few years to um, assess and include GIAC uh, and consider including GIAC in this partnership. Um, the reason that the partnership was created in the first place is because so many participants in the Youth Bureau are non-city residents. And of course we fund the Youth Bureau uh, and their staffing and we subsidize their services and try very hard to keep um, charges low. But we also recognize that we're providing this service to non-city residents. I think it's time to include GIAC in, in this analysis and perhaps uh, reassess the recreation partnership to um, um, to support the services that we fund uh, at GIAC for non-city residents. So could you 
um, who is on the negotiating team? Was this negotiated or is it just an automatic renewal? George, did you want to respond to that? I don't know the answer to that. It's not automatic. Um, I, I wrote the resolution with help from, uh, from Liz at, at the Youth Bureau. Um, uh, the <clears throat> Recreation Partnership is, is an excellent partnership. Uh, I'm on the board of GIAC now. I, I could be mistaken, but I haven't heard of any uh, large influx of non-city residents uh, taking advantage of GIAC programs. I, I will ask Leslin about that, but uh, this is a good program. Yeah, I, I won't say it's a new influx. It existed when I was on the board several years ago. Um, there was a, an exercise that was done and they actually did a, a, a dot map where they showed where all of their participants lived. And I was quite surprised to say, I mean, I, maybe it's fair to say 50%. Um, and of course, I think we all recognize that as a city becomes uh, more costly to live in, um, many families with young children are moving outside of the city, even though their lives, their work, their school might be in the city. And so they want to take advantage of, uh, of city programs because that's where the kids are coming out of school. So, um, you know, keeping in mind uh, that change in demographic, I think it would be very useful to reassess and actually ask these questions and should GIAC be included in the recreation partnership. Uh, thank you, Rob, G, I see your hand up. Yeah, I, I am no longer on uh, the liaison to the recreation partnership, but I was for the last two years and I, I saw Liz was here, but maybe she's not with us at the moment. Um, I'm sure every Cynthia knows and George too, uh, but for others, um, you know the 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 breakdown of of contributions from the different municipalities is based on usage. So that would have an impact if we're seeing significant numbers. Uh, but I think this is more of a, a, a coordination that should be happening between the Youth Bureau and GIAC rather than putting some pressure on the recreation partnership. Um, but uh, Cynthia, it's a good point. And I think we have asked this question in the past of, of GIAC. Um, so it would be good maybe to get some numbers about that. But I wouldn't want that to hold up the, this excellent partnership that, as George noted, has been going on for a while. Yeah, uh, thank you. I mean, I've been asking these questions for a while. <laughs> it always never seems quite to be the opportunity because we're in the midst of a contract. Um, so I don't know if it was raised before the contract was renegotiated, um, but I, I think I have been sort of ringing this bell for a few years now, uh, and I don't know have I don't really have any idea if if an examination has. Um, well, this was something down. before uh, the city administration committee. Um, we should, if we want to have a discussion on this, we should certainly have GIAC present. Uh, but is anyone proposing, uh, Rob uh, Gerhard? Well, I didn't want to be cutting you off. Go, go ahead. Well, ju just a quick point, and somebody else who has been part of this in the past can remind me, but I'm pretty sure that um, the agreement is not setting necessarily the budget. It, it, in other words, I think if in the future, even during the next four years of this agreement, that somehow GX programming got infused into the offerings of the city, it might have an impact on the contribution from the different municipalities. In other words, I think the execution of this agreement may not get in the way of that, but perhaps somebody like Ari or somebody else who's been on the rec partnership might know that. It's my understanding that the city is responsible for 25% of the money that the rec partnership spends. And the county's 25%, and uh, town of Ithaca's 25%, and the smaller towns, uh, based on their participation, make up the final 25%. But it's based on participation. Yeah, and I think those, that's reset every year in the budget. I believe. 
I believe that's right, that it's reset every year in the budget. And yeah. I guess Cynthia's question is whether the content of services targeted by that reset is adjusted each year as part of the budget. And I don't know the answer to that. I think Liz would know the answer to that best. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Um, well, are we ready to vote on this resolution as written and moved and seconded? Okay, all those in favor? Opposed? Okay, passes with one opposed. Thank you. Uh, did you want to move on to, well, which resolution did you want to move on to next, Robert? I am in fact going to move on to the other item moved out of consent agenda, uh, which will, I guess, now be 4.7. Um, and that is uh, the release of Southside Community Center uh, Fund in 2022 budget. Uh, whereas the Common Council included within the 2022 budget funding in restrictive contingency, $200,000 for Southside Community Center, which has previously been funded by the city. Now, therefore, be it resolved that said $200,000 in Southside Community funding be released from the restricted contingency account after execution of an MOU substantially similar to the previous city Southside MOU. I will move as written. And is there a second? Jorge, thank you. And I'll just note as we begin discussion here, um, Cynthia, I'm sure you have a question since it was your request to move this, but um, uh, that I we did discuss this uh, process and CA this month um, and uh, there was unanimity that uh, there was no uh, further information needed us uh, provided that the uh, requisite uh, materials that are regularly provided were given to Steve's office. So I would turn, I guess, to him first with an update on that. Uh, yeah, Robert, that's correct. Um, that's what went through the uh, committee process. Um, I know council did, in fact, put this into uh, restricted contingency back back in October when we spoke about this because um, there were some concerns at that time on you know where the funding was going to. Uh, I can tell you that uh, I just received today the uh, annual report from last year so that uh, I'll be looking at that and reviewing that to, to make sure that because uh, we still owe the fourth quarter payment to Southside for uh, 2021. And that's based on last year's activity um, that, in fact, then we would, if, if this money is released, uh, I would be asking for the 2022 activity on a quarterly basis, as we have been over the past several years, uh, in which uh, Southside then sends the information to me. We review the information, uh, the financial activity for Southside, and then determine uh, if uh, payment is necessary and applicable. And uh, in just about every case, we, we have made that payment. So certainly uh, if council wants to go a different direction, that's fine. Uh, we did try to include this in the other, um, the other uh, review from the Human Services Coalition, but that for this year kind of fell through uh, but we will be looking for different, different review processes for uh, 2023. Thank you. I appreciate the, uh, the review and, and update for that. Thank you very much. Sure. Any other comment or question? Okay, we're ready to vote. Thank you. All those in favor? And that looks unanimous. Great, thank you so much. We will resume our regularly scheduled CA programming with what is now 4.8. Uh, MOUs for outside organizations funded in 2022 budget. 
Whereas Common Council included within the 2022 budget funding and restricted contingency for two new nonprofits to which the city had not previously directed funding. And whereas Common Council asked for all new nonprofits to fill out a form to be turned into the controller no later than April 15, 2022. Now, therefore, be it resolved that such funding as council budgeted and restricted contingency for potential expenditure on services to be rendered by Black Hands Universal, BHU, and Unbroken Promises Initiative, UPI, shall be processed by the Common Council through satisfactory review and approval of the MO, uh, I'm sorry, and approval of the review and MOUs required by the following provisions of this resolution, and therefore are thereafter released from restricted contingency in such amount as the Common Council may determine, and be it further resolved that the city shall request a brief financial form to be filled out as they have previously for other organizations receiving city or county funding, turning the form into the controller's office by April 15, 2022, and the controller will provide the same to the Common Council for review, and be it further resolved that upon council approval of the program reviews, the attorney's office shall prepare for council approval separate MOUs for BHU and UPI, specifying the community services that each organization is required to, to deliver in exchange for the city's funding, requiring each organization to prepare and no later than September 1, 2022, file with the city controller for usage in the 2023 budget process, a report detailing the manner in which city funds were expended by that organization in 2022, how many people were served by that organization and in what manner, and requiring each organization to agree to collaborate with and amongst other nonprofit and city organizations to the maximum extent possible to ensure that services reach a broad population, avoid redundancy, and assist each other in becoming more efficient at serving their overlapping goals. I... I'm going to clarify, this is actually an error in the agenda. So the, the final resolved, I'm gonna keep watching Ari's head nodding because uh, it does. It says resolve that upon council approval, that is not what we passed out of committee. We uh, passed. So I think, I think what we passed is in that second line of that resolve. It's right. the attorney's office shall prepare for, for council the mayor. And that was supposed to, uh, I believe that was changed by the committee to mayor's approval. Yes, it is. It was. Anyone from CA misremember, remember that differently? It was for the, it was for the mayor's approval. That's the second line of that resolve. Second line. So resolved that upon council approval of the program reviews, the attorney's office shall prepare for the mayor's approval, separate MOUs for BHU and UPI. Um, yeah. I move what I just said. <laughs> Could do you mind reading that? I'm sorry, I that I like them out again, so Absolutely. I wasn't thinking. Yeah, about it. Uh, um, to reiterate, that last resolved is resolved that upon council approval of the program reviews, the attorney's office shall prepare for the mayor's approval separate MOUs for BHU and UPI, and then the rest is written. Okay, thank you, thank you for. Repeating. Um, is there a second on the revised? Jorge, thank you. Discussion? And I would just note that for colleagues who are not on CA, um, what the intention here was to avoid these organizations needing to wait for three separate common council meetings for this funding to be released. Um, the way we structured this was, uh, again, we'll, we'll, we'll be voting on this tonight, presuming it moves forward. Uh, Faith and I and Steve have been working on the draft questions, which will be circulated, Faith, soon. Sorry, tomorrow. I'm meeting with Steve tomorrow. <laughs> okay. Um, but we just, we, we, you know, we, the committee speaking with Faith and Ari kind of uh, concluded that um, this way we still have the sort of uh, oversight process for new organizations that previous council had apparently wanted in the budget process, uh, while also, again, avoiding this dragging out into a third month just by virtue of the final approvals. And I'm sure Ari can more eloquently speak to what I attempted to just put into layperson's terms. Oh, no, I think that's, that's, that's correct. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, are we ready to vote? All those in favor of this resolution as um, amended? Uh, 
Okay, thank you. And that looks like a unanimous vote. Uh, we are approaching that witching hour uh, when we will have to make a motion to extend. And I'm wondering, do we want to do that before Steve's report? Okay, Rob, uh, Robert. I will, I will move that we, uh, we extend for one hour. Is there a second? For a half hour. Well, I believe we have it. other items uh, in executive, George, that we're gonna have to get oh, through. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And okay, so Cynthia, you seconded. Um, all those in favor of extending for one hour. I said, bring snacks tonight. <laughs> yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you. Um, what are people's preferences? Would you like to take, uh, would you like to hear from Steve now and then take a 10 minute break or would you like to take a 10 minute break now? Don't all mute at once. Uh, Steve. Let's hear from Steve. Steve, Steve, Steve. Okay, Steve, you're on. <laughs> okay, I'll be quick. Uh, in case people need to get to their break. Um, so uh, we are waiting for final New York State budget, which uh, you probably all know is a little overdue. So hopefully we get that information soon. Once we get details, I'll let you know. But for the most part, um, you know, our, our funding seems to be maintained uh, that we currently receive and hopefully additional funding will be available. I know there was some push to add a COLA adjustment to the general state aid. Hopefully that occurs, but I'm not going to hold my breath there. On uh, 2022 item sales tax, I'll just say that uh, we are up 11.6% uh, for if you're comparing same time period to 2021. So that's great news. Uh, parking revenues continue to be slow uh, in collections. We have collected $365 to date. Uh, I will say that in the next couple of months, the Green Garage uh, project will come online. So uh, that will start uh, to feed into our collections for parking uh, revenue. So that will be good. Uh, building permit revenues, of course, um, we did increase. And the, the budget actually uh, reflects uh, higher uh, anticipated uh, construction activity inside the city. We budgeted at $2,070,000 for 22. Uh, we have collected $280,000 uh, in this revenue um, account to date, but it's early in the process. So we'll, we'll hope that uh, once construction season uh, ramps up that uh, you know, so items such as uh, reduced project costs or project delays that we saw in our uh, lack of collections in 21 uh, will not find their way to our collections this year. So uh, we'll be looking forward to uh, seeing what happens with those projects. I should say site development fees, we budgeted at $220,000 uh, for 22. We have collected 137000 So we're off to a good start with those fees. Um, and uh, just to note, you all know that we've seen uh, quite a spike in inflation. The CPI is running uh, after a couple months at 7.7%, very, very high. And we haven't seen this uh, high of CPI since 2008. One hand is good for the Cornell MOU payment, which is driven by the CPI. So that means uh, that would be a higher a higher contribution from Cornell University as a result. But really what it means for the city is higher operating costs um, uh, for our operations. We're seeing that, uh, you know, higher costs to consumers and higher costs in our operations. If we look across the board in our operations, we are seeing higher costs everywhere. So from, from bidding to fuel, uh, to, to material costs, to pretty much everything we're doing these days is, is much more expensive. So uh, impacts from COVID uh, certainly will continue uh, for the next year. So uh, with that, I think I'll end the report and let people get to the break if they need to. Uh, before that, does anyone have questions for Steve? George. <clears throat> oh, Muted. Mm -hmm. Sorry, 
Um, Steve, can you shed any light on this uh, South Side janitor business? Uh, I don't know that, that I can. Probably uh, Mike and DPW staff is is uh, would have more details. I can okay. tell you that I know um, that because of short staff uh, over DPW crews that they've had to pull 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 that. Uh, person off to cover other areas of the city facilities. So that might have something to do with the problem they're seeing there. But otherwise, uh, I can't really tell you too much in detail uh, with okay, that. But I'll, I'll ask Mike. Yeah, I think Mike probably could give you more details than I could. All right. Thanks. Yep. Thanks for raising that question, George. Good follow up from an earlier comment. And I know that Phoebe raised it at uh, our last meeting. So thank you for following up. Okay, it is 1057. Uh, <clears throat> can we agree to a 10 minute break and then reconvene? Great, thank you.
I know we paused the recording, but are we still live on YouTube right now? Yes. Um, it says live on YouTube, yes. There all are right. all people. Well, for, for Robert and for Matt Butler, I'm sorry you're still watching. I am not married, um, but I, I have a lovely orphan who means the world to me. Um, but this is actually a ring of all of the different uh, musical keys. So I played jazz growing up and I was very bad at memorizing how to track whose instruments were tuned which ways. And I played trumpet. So like, you know, have a E flat sax or a B flat trumpet. I would spin this in a way so that I could see what my call out to my friends would be without having to do the thinking in my head. I have not played jazz in a very long time, but <laughs> that's brilliant. <laughs> so, Great uh, style and nice. purpose. <laughs> um, okay. Thank you. It looks like everyone is back. Um, So we will now move on to the PEDC items and one of those items was pulled 5.2. So we have one uh, item for consideration that is 5.1. Uh, 5.1, the first part A is, and this is dealing with an ordinance to amend chapter 258 the city of Ithaca municipal code entitled rental housing regarding notification of tenants. Uh, the first um, part of this resolution is declaring lead agency resolved that the common council of the city of Ithaca does hereby declare itself lead agency for the environmental review of the proposal to amend chapter 258 of the city of Ithaca municipal code entitled Rental Housing Regarding Notification of Tenants. And I so move. Is there a second? Cynthia, thank you. And uh, any, is let's vote on this. <laughs> the discussion will come when we're actually looking at the, uh, the ordinance. So all those in favor of declaration of lead agency. Thank you. And then the next is a declaration of environmental significance uh, resolved that Common Council declares itself lead agency in this matter, hereby determines that the proposed action at issue will not have a significant effect on the environment and that further environmental reviews is unnecessary. Be it further resolved that this resolution constitutes notice of this neg deck and that the city clerk is hereby directed to file a copy of the same together with any attachments in the city clerk's office and forward the same to any other parties as required by law. And I so move, is there a second? I saw Jorge's hand first, thank you. And all those in favor of declaration of environmental significance, NEGDEC. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then the, uh, 5.1 C, uh, this is the actual ordinance, a um, couple of, I think just typo corrections in this, so I will read it. Uh, whereas the city of Ithaca has a substantial renter population with 74% of Ithaca's 32,108 residents renting. And whereas by providing a 120 day waiting period before receiving an opportunity to renew a lease, a tenant will have had ample and appropriate time to decide on whether to negotiate to renew as well as landlords will have more opportunity to rent to tenants attending Cornell University. Now, therefore, be it resolved um, that section 258 of the city's municipal code is hereby amended as follows. The renewal of rental agreements notification to tenants, the landlords shall provide a minimum of 120 days written notice to current tenants. Uh, 
before any of the following, renewing the current rental agreement or showing the residential unit to prospective new tenants or otherwise suggesting to prospective tenants that the unit is currently available for rent. Three, entering into a rental agreement with new tenants. Such written notice and it goes on, the current rental agreement period is less than nine months. Um, a summons and complaint to recover possession of the premises has been filed and served on the current tenant in accordance with all applicable, applicable laws and rules. And three, the landlord and tenant mutually agree in writing to waive the notice period by specifically including the following language, bolded and explicitly visible on the first page of the contract. And that bolding will include, as per chapter 258-10A of the City of Ithaca Municipal Code, landlords shall provide a minimum 120 days written notice to current tenants of a residential unit before doing any of the following. One, renewing the current rental agreement. Two, showing the residential unit to prospective new tenants or otherwise suggesting to prospective new tenants or otherwise suggesting when there's a duplicate there, uh, suggesting to prospective tenants that the unit avail available for rent, we will clean up that language uh, for any redundancy. Uh, and three, entering into a rental agreement with new tenants. By initialing here, and this is the significant change, so it really confirms that someone has read and understood, at least read, by initialing here, I fully understand and willingly waive my rights to 120 days written notice in advance of the above. And this ordinance shall take effect on May 31, 2022, after publication of the ordinance pursuant to the city charter. And I so move with the stated, uh, corrections of language and, and typos. Uh, is, is there a second? Patrick, thank you. And discussion, Jeffrey, I saw your hand. Yes, I'd, I'd like to make a motion to, oh, can you guys hear me? I'm, I'm yes. Not, sorry. Just a motion to uh, amend some language here, um, if it's amenable to folks. I'm concerned about the uh, whereas, at the, uh, the very first whereas, um, whereas the city of Ithaca has a substantial renter population, 74% of Ithaca's 32,108 residents renting. And um, basically my issue with that, and I've discussed it with some members here, uh, is that that is a static figure that will bear fluctuations uh, and changes going forward. Um, and I also have, a problem with having that uh, stated as such, I, I think that there's been some misuse of that, those numbers, because they haven't been parsed in meaningful ways that, uh, you know, distinguish what that says about Ithaca and our renter community. Um, I, I would favor language, and I, I have a proposal for that. Um, let me just bring it up here. Something on the order of, and I can put it in the chat. I'll put it here. Um, I go through. Whereas the city has a seasonal housing market with, which serves a sizable student and transient rental population. Um, something on the order of that, that that really speaks to why we have 74% renting in the city. And I think that there are really unique features of the city that contribute to that. Um, to, but to have it be a number, you, you uh, first of all, that number doesn't bear the test of time and, and will need constant re-assessing. Uh, and secondly, it, uh, I, I think it, it lends itself to misuse and rhetoric. Um, and then just lastly, I just wanna you know, applaud the process here. I've been watching it closely. I think uh, really thoughtful discussions have come forth. Um, Patrick has labored diligently to, to bring this to the, the, the moment that we're at right now. Um, so certainly want to lend my support to it but that is a problematic feature that remains. Um, and, uh, and the last factor to, to consider here is, you know, we did hit a constitutional limit in this discussion. Um, that was significant to note. Uh, and and I, I'm happy to see that the waiver has been restored. 
Uh, so yeah, someone would, would, uh, would join me in, in pursuing this uh, change here. So is there a, uh, a second on Jeffrey's motion? So uh, point of order. Yes. Um, is it friendly is the first question I think, right? Yeah, yeah. Is, so is this a friendly amendment to, I will say to um, Patrick who drafted the language and seconded the, the resolution? Yeah, I, I, I'm not opposed to changing that. Whereas, you know, I think the, the resolved and the parts that are changing, I think is what matters. So I, I, I have no issue switching to, um, let me get that exact word that Jeff put in the chat. Yeah, whereas the city is a seasonal housing market and serves a sizable student transient rental population, I have no problem with that. I, I, I don't mean to jump, I just, I, I would, say I'd like to strike maybe the transient piece. Uh, I, I, you know, you can have rental populations where someone lives in the community their whole life and rents. And, and I, I sort of, um, I don't like the, for the same reason, Jeff, that you have an issue with the static, I, I have an issue with the idea that suggesting, uh, you know, renters are any less part of our community than, than homeowners. But, but like, I, I, get the, I get the issue about like this, the rental piece. I just, the transient piece, that particular word, I, I would push back on a little bit. Would it be advisable and uh, perhaps more um, inclusive and yet general to change that whereas by removing the numbers and leaving it at whereas the city of Ithaca has a substantial renter population? Friendly. Right. So, sorry, go ahead, Jeff. I didn't mean to cut you off. Bingo. <clears throat> um, I just wanted to speak to both Rob's point and, and Laura's point. I mean, I I think my main issue is having the numbers in there. Um, I think it's interesting to you know to to describe the market a bit more that necessitated this change and and really makes it meaningful to the community. Um, I think that word transient is interesting because it that's part of why it probably is a higher percentage of rental population. You know, if you've got people moving in, moving out, not committing to place on a large scale, that uh, is a factor of being a university town. I think that that has implications, but I'm not wedded to that language, absolutely. Um, well, I will say in, in my neighborhood, there are renters who are long-term renters who have been in their homes um, for, for many years. So I, I too would, take issue with that term transient and I, I guess would just prefer that we, uh, I, I take your point about that being a static figure. So just remove the figure and um, state, which I believe is a current fact and will continue to be a fact that Ithaca has a substantial renter population. I like, I like uh, Laura's version personally. That's fine with me as well. And I'd be happy to vote for the bill. Laura, so that's, oh, sorry, I was going to say it's friendly to do your cut of everything after the comma there. Okay, thank you. And Jorge, I see that your hand is up. Didn't mean to yeah, cut uh, you off. You're more than fine. Uh, it's, it wasn't related to this specific point. Um, but yeah, like I, I just wanted to mention, I'm very supportive of this bill. I think it's a really good idea. Um, uh, for all involved parties. I just had a question. Um, I don't know if this is a question um, for, for any, Patrick, have you, uh, I know you've been drafting this or Ari, uh, the question of uh, sort of enforceability about what this looks like if in a situation where, you know, a landlord just, you know, I know we're dealing right now with a situation where there's a small business, um, we talked about an NCA of just not following the law in terms of, of what the regulation should be. Um, for um, uh, for taxi fares, and so I'm just wondering what um, like what the what the recourse is in terms of enforcement um, if a landlord isn't um, you know following through on on um, adhering to like the the lease renewal notice. Yeah, um, I, I can speak to that. Um, yeah, the um, the reality of um, housing law enforcement, which speaks directly to our right to counsel program, might I add, um, 
uh, in, uh, in, all, in all sorts of municipal settings um, is that it, it does end up being a matter for um, landlord tenant um, uh, relations and, and, and legal proceedings. Um, so uh, to the extent that there were enforcement proceedings, the enforcement would be um, the tenant or landlord, depending who is acting, um, uh, bringing an action um, in, in uh, city court and housing court to, um, to work through those issues. Um, and while I'm speaking, I'll just very briefly say, um, uh, Laura, I know you moved this um, as read, not written. Um, I presume that you did intend for it um, to say, uh, and be it ordained and enacted rather than um, be it resolved. As a Correct. Minor, very minor thank you. Yeah. Yes, okay. thank you. I'll just quickly add, I think, uh, Jorge, to your question is, um, I think everybody in PDC has, has has met our sample tenants one, two, and three, and what does that proceeding look like, depending on who does what. Um, but this is not intended to be an outright punishing thing on like June 1st of this year. We're going to be like, right, who has it, who doesn't. It's something we intend to collaborate with all of the major medium and small landlords throughout the city to just say, hey, this is what's here now. It's surprisingly easy to see uh, sample contracts across everybody's websites. So our hope is to not be judgmental or attacking in any way, but to say, hey, this is updated stuff. Um, please include it. And if not, then tenants one, two, and three will become a reality. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, I'm glad to hear about that, but just sort of as a follow-up. So will it be like, will there, will we be doing like some type of, you know, Poly ed, political education, like outreach to the tenant, broader tenant community, because I know right now there's a lot of confusion amongst tenants and landlords about like what the existing housing law is. And so if are, are we going to be like doing conversations? about? So this is what it looks like now, um, you know, because council obviously can't watch everything. Um, and if it, the onus is going to fall on the tenants and landlords themselves, I'm just wondering if council is taking any external steps um, towards making sure that we're you know, folks are aware about this uh, new addition to the, the law, especially so close to like the summer season and whatnot. I know I will be. Um, if anybody, you're all more than welcome to walk with me uh, from College Ave to Eddie and back and start going street by street trying to get folks. But I'm more than happy to work with anybody, everybody about, you know, like you're saying, it's, about, it's intended to be educational. It's not intended to be hammer down these the new changes supposed to be here's what we're here's what's not changed and we'd like to have folks follow them yeah um thank you thank you and um i am remiss um in uh not asking if uh and pardon me for uh not following procedure but there is a motion on the floor to um revise that first whereas I think it was accepted as friendly. I'm not sure if the seconder. Oh, so you did it. accept that as friendly? Who, who was the seconder? I was. I, I said the changing that Laura proposed was friendly. Yeah, but who seconded the motion? I mean, uh, I did. Laura led the motion. I, mo yeah. I moved. It. Oh, Laura I got it. Okay. And yeah. Patrick. Okay. Yep. So if it's friendly to both of you, then, then you're set. That's all you need to do. Okay. Any other I just have a question of, 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 of Ari real quick? Sure. Uh, Ari, I was hoping that just so that I, I understand it correctly, <laughs> I, I was curious if you could just lend a little light onto what was the constitutional dilemma that we ran into with the waiver uh, and, and how was that resolved in this bill? So if I recall correctly, that was discussed in executive session and, um, uh, and, I, and I think it could compromise the city's intentions and abilities to discuss that um, in, in this setting. I just wouldn't have been aware of that, so. <laughs> okay. Uh, Patrick, did you have another comment on this? Yeah, I, just the one thing I, I did want to add in sort of how it's like, you know, I apologize everybody did not ask you to go back and watch six months with the PDC meetings, but the sort of short of this evolution um, with the constitutional question was we agreed, we decided to keep the waiver in, but this new language we're asking to be put into all the contracts is meant to start conversation. And it is meant for people to, you know, I look at my own contract and it, 
you know, it's line 20 on the fifth page or whatever that just says like, I waive this and you don't think twice about it. The intent of this specific ordinance is to have that language centered and to at least have people start talking more about it and have an understanding of what does 258-10 mean to everybody but the 12 people on the Zoom call. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, Cynthia, did you have a comment? Yes, um, I know that uh, Julie is going to clean up the language to make sure that the uh, items one through one, two, three are basically replicating items one, two, three in, in section A. I just also wanted to collect the typo that says um, 120 days written notice to current tenants of a residential unit before doing any of the following. <laughs> uh, and make sure we just correct that too. Um, and also, um, I'm very happy to see this amendment um, and these changes. Uh, it was long overdue. And uh, it took a lot of work to get us here and, and thank Patrick for, for steering us through this process. I think we have a really good um, uh, final product. So thank you, Patrick. Yeah, yeah. Rob? Uh, yeah, I'll just add my thanks in there too. But I also wanted to note, uh, this is for Jorge and, and Patrick and also for the city. While I don't wanna absolve the city of the responsibility of making sure our citizens know about this, I do think that the, the majority of people who are gonna be impacted by it are uh, college students, both at Cornell and perhaps at Ithaca College. And we should ensure that we leverage our partnerships there and make sure they do their part in informing their communities about this. So it doesn't always seem to wanna to fall solely on the city's shoulders. So I hope you're taking advantage of that while you're also walking throughout college town knocking on doors. Good Friends are gonna point. make a scene my emails uh, for the next couple of days, no doubt about that. Thank you. Um, Robert, did you have a comment? I have a motion to call the question so that we do not need to extend this again. Thank I appreciate you. all the work everyone's done, but it is 1030. Thank you. Okay, question has been called. Let's take a vote. All those in favor of this ordinance as amended? Okay, that looks unanimous. Thank you. And thank you, Robert. You read my mind. <laughs> Quick question for Ari. Technically, are we supposed to vote on a call Call the question. We have to vote uh, to call yeah, the question. Yeah, I, th I think yes. I think my, well, okay. the point was that we were already up to that vote anyway. So just yeah. Say. So next time we have to vote to call the question and then call the question. <laughs> oh, not if we're actually up to the vote anyway. Okay. Are we good to move on then? Did we need to go back and do anything? Please say no. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. We're now up to individual member filed resolutions. Um, and I will read the first. Uh, Rod Howe commented on this at the hours ago at the outset of our meeting. Um, naming of bridge for Kirby Edmonds. Uh, whereas the town of Ithaca supervisor Rod Howe reached out to acting mayor Laura Lewis inquiring into naming the bridge spanning Route 13 near Home Depot, affectionately known as the Bridge to Nowhere, as the Kirby Edmonds Bridge to honor the lifelong work and achievements of Mr. Edmonds. And whereas this bridge is geographically located on the border of the city of Ithaca and the town of Ithaca, and is an integral connector to the Gateway Trail and the soon to be extended Black Diamond Trail. And whereas Kirby Edmonds dedicated himself to community service and building a better world through conflict resolution and mediation, dismantling exclusive practices, addressing racism and bridging differences by bringing together diverse groups to hold respectful but frank dialogues. And whereas Kirby who passed away in August, 2020 was known for adding his voice quietly yet with impact and for his considerable talent as a facilitator 
in situations where he worked with others to further a vision. If it's not Wi-Fi going out, it's my lights going out. Uh, he worked with others to further a vision of justice for all. And whereas Kirby was known as a builder of movements, he also took on other mantles, contributor, connector, leader, and encouraging of others to plan actions to ensure greater power and resources into people's hands as seen locally with his spearheading, the creation of Building Bridges, the collective impact initiative to promote a socially just, ecologically sound, sustainable economy in the Tompkins County region. And whereas Kirby's skills as a facilitator contributed greatly to the development of the city of Ithaca's comprehensive plan, his assistance in distributing news and information regarding local relief efforts during the pandemic, despite his own declining health, was yet another contribution to our community among, among many other initiatives he aided. And whereas Common Council believes that the naming of this bridge would be a fitting recognition of the lifelong work and dedication Kirby offered to the greater Ithaca community. Now, therefore, be it resolved that Common Council hereby names the bridge over Route 13 near Home Depot as the Kirby Edmonds Bridge, so that it will forever be known as the bridge that will lead one to a place of peace, beauty, connection, and adventure much as its namesake did throughout his life, and I so move. Cynthia seconds. Any discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. And my thanks to Kirby's impact on our community. OK, uh, Robert, there is another. Uh, Member filed resolution, thank you. All right, uh, this is commitment to the stretch to zero pilot program. Whereas the city of Ithaca has demonstrated its desire and commitment to be a leader in sustainability and social equity as exemplified by the adoption of the Ithaca Green New Deal. And whereas in 2019, the state of New York signed the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act which committed New York State to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 40% by 2030 and at least 85% by 2050. And whereas the city has further demonstrated its commitment to reduce greenhouse gas emissions through the adoption of the Ithaca Energy Code Supplement in May 2021, eventually requiring new constructions and major renovations to stop relying on fossil fuels to meet their energy needs, and whereas the city continues to strengthen its energy codes and further develop an energy performance standard applying to existing commercial and residential buildings, and whereas the city has further demonstrated its commitment to reducing greenhouse gases from energy use inside buildings by approving the Energy Efficiency Retrofit and Thermal Load Electrification Program in November 2021, and whereas in support of the Climate Act, the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority is soliciting <clears throat> funding proposals for the stretch to zero pilot program for cities that will create and test workable approaches for the local and statewide implementation of a decarbonized zero on-site greenhouse gas emission code. And whereas a stretch to zero award would provide half a million dollars to the city in exchange for formal information sharing on the initiatives and associated processes related to electrification and the Ithaca Green New Deal. And whereas the stretch to zero award would require no matching funds. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the city authorizes staff to apply to be part of the Stretch to Zero program managed by NYSERDA to develop the required agreements between the funder and the city and to share information about decarbonization and electrification processes and initiatives with NYSERDA, including financing models for electrification, initiatives and programs that support BIPOC and low to moderate income residents in the transition to a decarbonized economy, data collection, management and workflow expectations for electrification of commercial and residential buildings, workforce development models, including recruitment, certifications, micro-credentialing, training, job placement, and wraparound infrastructure, and be it further resolved that the planning and development department will be responsible of communicating and reporting to NYSERDA's stretch to zero pilot program. I so move. Is there a second? Uh, Duxon, thank you. Any discussion? I see that Rebecca is here. Thank you for hanging with us so late. 
I'll just note for colleagues uh, that the reason this is a member filed resolution is in part because of grant deadlines, which I certainly sympathize with. Any discussion? Yes, Cynthia. Well, thank you to Louise and Rebecca for, uh, and also to Robert for bringing this forward. Um, it sounds like basically it's just, we get some money for sharing information on the things that we're doing anyway. Um, is that correct? Or is there, there's nothing new that's gonna be added onto our workload except for reporting out of information that we're gathering. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Uh you know, it pays to be first uh, in this case, anyway. <laughs> okay, and uh, what would this five hundred thousand dollars be used for? Does this go into the general fund? Do we get to use it? The the money is supposed to go towards achieving the the goal of reducing emissions one hundred percent inside buildings. So there are a number of actions that would qualify for that. Uh, but one of them, the most important one is to develop a building performance standard, which is uh, uh, an energy supplement, energy code supplement for existing buildings. So we would start working on that and that would allow us to probably hire some uh, consultants, some experts uh, at the national level that will help us develop the, the code in a way that you know it's fair on one hand, but on the other, you know, also achievable. So that's just an example. So the money would be used to create a new supplemental requirement to the city's existing energy code? No, that was an example. Uh, there are many activities that qualify. At the end of the day, you know what NYSERDA is recognizing with this pilot program is that new buildings is the easy part. Existing buildings is a really hard one, especially in upstate New York when you have buildings that are 150 years old. So the, in, in recognition of that, they want to have a pilot program. And this pilot has some parameters, but it's open enough because nobody knows, nobody has made it that far. You know, we are striving to be the first city in the country to do that. Uh, and there are, you know, a couple of other places that may qualify. So right now, the money will go to helping us out to make it happen. An example would be developing a building performance standard, but it could be to hire consultants, it could be to you know, acquire technology or, or software to help us mon monitor that the emissions are being reduced, etc. So it, it's, it's kind of open uh, on that side. I don't know, Rebecca, do you have more information than that? No, that's my understanding also is that as long as it's used to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions within um, the city's building stock, that it's, it's basically a freebie. Um, so yeah. <laughs> and maybe Luis, we Thank could you. just circulate the um like the RFP for colleagues and we, I can help interpret that just in terms of like the full allowables. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, and, and once again, what uh what Robert was saying is that in order to participate in the program, and I said this asking that it's not just you know the crazy dudes in sustainability pushing this, but you know, there is you know support from the city that this is a, you know, something the city is trying to do. So the reason for the resolution is that way Common Council will show support for the sustainability team and then we'll apply to NYSERDA with your support and then, you know, things get going. And we can definitely share that RFP. I think it's worth noting that there are two categories that exist within that program and we are applying for category one which um, is the $500,000 award. The, the latter is, is a smaller amount of money. Yeah, the second category is $100,000. And, and as far as I know, there's only two cities in the entire state that qualify, we're one of them. So that they, you know, kind of cool, just money there. Okay, Who's thank the other you. one? I, I think it would be uh, Bedford, the town of Bedford. But I'm not okay. entirely sure, but I believe it would be yeah. I do want to. I do want to keep us moving. Um, I don't mean to cut this short, but if no one has any other crucial questions at this point, are we ready to vote? Okay. All those in favor? And that looks unanimous. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Thanks, Luis, and thanks, uh, Rebecca. Much appreciated. 
Have a good night, everybody. Good luck. Thank you. Where are you going? <laughs> we now have some right. Common Council appointments that need our approval. The first is appointment to the local, uh, the City of Ithaca Local Board of Assessment Review. Uh, and I have another name to add here. Resolved that Marjorie Olds, Marshall McCormick, and Cyril Sandstrom as alternate be appointed to the City of Ithaca Local Advisory Board of Assessment Review for 2022. Uh, and I so move. Is there a second? Patrick? All those in favor? Thank you. Thank you. And then a final appointment, appointment to the Board of Zoning Appeals resolved that Andre Gardner be appointed to the BZA with a term to expire December 31, 2024. And I so move. Is there a second? Patrick, thank you. And all those in favor. I will say that uh, Andre has been attending BZA meetings, so this is helpful. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we will now move on. Uh, we do have two executive sessions and I will uh, ask for vote, pardon me, uh, the uh, first, is a motion to enter into executive session to discuss collective bargaining negotiations. So I will move that and look for a sec. Robert? Uh, before, I, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, we have about se 17 minutes left or so. And I think we have, to, we have to make that motion to extend before we enter executive session, correct, Ari? Um, I suppose that's true. Yes. Yeah. Um, that that's uh, that's at least a, a wise practice in any event. I will uh, reluctantly move to add twenty five minutes to our meeting time. Uh, no, I will uh, reluctantly move to add an hour to our meeting time. No, I, I, I'm not going another hour. I'm going to go home. You are home. <laughs> How do you know? <laughs> <laughs> How about if we add thirty minutes? All right, and we will try to be very. Let's, let's be. Meeting, let's be to the meeting point. next week. Are these things so urgent? Can we can we do them yes. on Wednesday next? They're they're absolutely not uh, urgent. Okay. No, we need these executive sessions tonight. I'm sorry. When you say thirty, let's get on with it. Thirty minutes beyond eleven o'clock. Yes. Thirty minutes beyond the hour we had. Right. Yeah. Yes. So I will to clarify. I will move for uh, us ending at eleven thirty. I'll second. All those in favor? Reluctantly. Reluctantly, yes. I get it. Okay, agreed. Uh, thank you, Robert. I was trying to not have to go there, but we do have to go there. So again, uh, the first executive session, I will ask for a motion. I've moved to enter into executive session to discuss collective bargaining negotiations. Is there a second? Patrick, thank you. And all those in favor, again, reluctantly, uh, but yes, okay, thank you. And let me now uh, add the motion to enter into a second executive session to discuss the purchase or sale of real estate. And I so move. And Patrick seconds. And all those in favor. Okay, thank you. And the reason for moving these two executive sessions together is so that we do not have to go back and forth. Um, and hopefully we can be more efficient that way. 
And, and Laura, I think we may want to note for the public that I believe there are no anticipated additional council actions or votes coming out of these tonight. Yes, thank you, Ari. So anyone who's staying up with us this late, uh, yes, there are no votes expected. Okay, uh, we do have um, an executive session Zoom link and those staff who will be joining us for each of the two executive sessions uh, will be then let in by, by Julie. Patrick, did you have a comment? I was waiting goodbye as I moved into the news. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And so I think for the first executive session, that's everybody uh, who's uh, on the screen right now, I think is in that first executive session. I, I believe is correct. So um, do we need to go to the separate Zoom link? Yes, yes, we do. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. All right.